I'm Scott Hodge, President of the Tax Foundation. On behalf of Will Morris and Mike Devereaux and our partners at the European Tax Policy Forum, I want to thank you for tuning in to this very important conference to discuss the question, is the world economy ready for a new tax system? Um, we'll have a few housekeeping items here to start with. I uh, do want to remind people that uh, the program is being uh, recorded, uh, and uh, we want to make this available later on for folks um, so that uh, in case you know people have missed it or they missed part of it, they can come back and attend it, or uh, uh, view it again. Uh, all attendees are muted, um, and you can ask questions uh, using the little Q and A button there at the bottom. And uh, please include your name and, and organization and so forth, and uh, address uh, your questions to any of the panelists. So thank you again for tuning in. Uh, you know, last Friday the OECD's inclusive framework outlined their plan to rewrite the global tax rules. And we thought this would be a really good opportunity to shine some light on the implications of those policies. We have three excellent panels today and an impressive lineup of speakers who will discuss the impact of pillar one and pillar two and included a broader discussion of the prospects of implementation and administrability. And in a few minutes, we'll hear from our good friend, uh, uh, Representative Kevin Brady, ranking member of the House Ways and Means Committee in the US Congress with his thoughts on the OECD's work. You know, last week I read a news article in Political EU about the inclusive frameworks progress. The first line of that article kind of seemed like a, an appropriate way to frame our discussion today. It says, quote, an agreement to overhaul the global tax system is almost done. Now comes the hard part, making it work. Well, those seem like pretty good insights, but I think that it will take more than a five page statement from the OECD to declare the deal done. And I'm sure some of our panelists will say that the statement raises as many questions as it answers. Now, as far as the second point, the hard part of making it work, I think the author vastly under, underestimated how hard it will be to make this work, especially in the timeline that they've set for themselves. What the post-COVID global economy needs right now is certainty. Global FDI has been falling for the last five years and fell 38% last year alone. The OECD statement assures us that enacting Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 will bring stability to the global tax system. Well, that might be welcome, especially if it leads to the removal of country-specific digital services taxes. But a glaring omission from the statement is an impact statement, which we're waiting for. What are the economic costs of imposing stability on a global tax system? The statement says that, quote, on average, low, middle, and high-income countries will all experience revenue gains as a result of pillar one. Well, how can this be? Not every country can be a winner. Which countries are losers and at what cost? And shouldn't we know that before moving forward? And the statement now estimates that Pillar 2 could raise as much as 150 billion in new revenue globally per year. The question for our panelists will be, what are the potential economic impacts of Pillar 2? And can the global economy weather a new layer of taxes on capital flows? Another consideration is that some countries are having doubts about the OECD process, including some African countries that still have not signed on. After all, Pillar 2 is voluntary. So another question for our panelists is, is the inclusive framework as unified as it seems? But then there is a brewing tax debate here in the United States. It's clear that our lawmakers are having difficulty aligning our new guilty tax with the new global minimum. And there's been even less public debate here in the United States about how to implement Pillar 1. So another question we may consider today is, what are the implications of Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen negotiating a 15% global minimum tax with the OECD? Against the backdrop of our Congress considering extensive changes to our guilty regime that could lead, leave us well outside of this global norm. How will other countries respond to that? Well, these are just a few of the questions, issues, and topics that we'll consider during these interesting panels. But now I'd like to introduce our good friend, 
uh, of the Tax Foundation, uh, Representative Kevin Brady from Texas, ranking member of the Ways and Means Committee, and architect of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in, in 2017 that made the U.S. more competitive by cutting the corporate tax rate and implementing these new international tax rules. So, Congressman, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us uh, today. We appreciate you coming on and sharing your thoughts on this very important issue. Scott, Scott, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for your leadership in the foundation itself. Since 1937, the Tax Foundation has been a leading voice on principled pro-growth tax reform and policies in the United States. Under your leadership, the Tax Foundation has expanded its reach into global tax, an important effort as OECD negotiations continue. As you know, four years ago, Congress was wrapping up generational tax reform. After three decades of stagnation, in our tax code as we continue to fall farther behind our foreign competitors, we were finally able to modernize the international system and reduce our highest in the world corporate rate. Dozens of other countries have already taken these steps because they knew a competitive tax system brings investment and jobs and growth. And since the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, 10 countries have lowered their corporate tax rates, knowing that just because America decided finally be to become competitive doesn't mean they're gonna stand around and allow that to happen. The results of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act speak for themselves. America leapfrogged to the number one most competitive economy in the world, and that helped a lot of Americans. Unemployment fell to all-time lows. Incomes for Black, Hispanic, and Asian Americans saw record increases. Wages grew at the fastest rate in the decade, and wages grew faster for lower-income workers than for supervisors or their executives. Income inequality decreased for the first time in a half a century. R&D investment hit record highs. And as you know, we didn't just lower our business tax rates. We redesigned the tax code so our U.S. companies could compete and win anywhere in the world, including here at home. The international tax reforms modernized their tax code in many ways, and they were groundbreaking in other respects. We ended two major problems that accumulated under our prior broken tax code, corporate inversions and trillions of dollars in earnings trapped overseas. An EY study showed that from 2004 to 2016, over $510 billion investment, the equivalent of 1,400 companies and business units changed hands from American ownership to foreign ownership due to our uncompetitive tax system. This became a signature hallmark of the Obama-Biden administration, especially as they put more pressure on American businesses with higher taxes and more regulation. What we saw were jobs fleeing overseas, as well as investment, manufacturing, and intellectual property. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, while not perfect, put a complete stop to the exodus. We went from thousands of companies fleeing to zero. We also took steps that no other countries have, including a transition tax on repatriation, and a first of its kind, kind global minimum tax. This was part of our goal to the end tax pre preferences that exported income and profits to low tax countries or imported deductions to artificially lower taxes here in the United States. That global minimum tax guilty prevents abusive profit shifting. No longer can a company achieve zero tax income by funneling its income to tax havens. We also did this, guilty was not about punishing businesses. It, in fact, recognized the importance of US companies competing and winning around the world where the customers are at. It struck the right balance between protecting the US tax base and ensuring that American companies, workers can compete and win in the global economy. Other countries apparently came to admire guilty as we saw it become a second pillar in the OECD's global project to address the digitalization of the economy. There's been nothing to stop individual countries from implementing their own form of guilty, yet none have elected to do so. Why is that? Well, because most countries are interested in protecting their economies and their workers from competition. Contrary to the Biden administration's claim that other countries will follow the US to higher tax, that's never been true. For years, we had a corporate rate 15% percentage points above the OECD average, and countries continued to cut their taxes. And again, no other countries passed a global minimum tax in the four years since we did this. 
That's why the prior administration demanded that the OECD project must provide grandfathering status to guilty. American companies already face a global minimum tax and the OECD shouldn't be using pillar two to create an unfair advantage against them. In addition, because of interactions within our US international tax code, guilty already taxes most American companies foreign earnings at a rate higher than what's been considered at the OECD. Negotiators from other countries and OECD technical staff came to accept the reasonable position that guilty should be grandfathered. But this year we've lost ground in the negotiations. Guilty grandfathering is no longer assured. And Democrats wanna expedite a guilty tax increase long before the rest of the world has even taken action. Secretary Yellen started negotiations in my view from a weaker position based on the, their need to raise our corporate rate so high. And I think the, this has made it worse. The Biden administration, in my view, is going it alone. Neither I nor finance committee, my finance committee counterpart, uh, Senator Crapo, have engaged in any meaningful consultation. Yet Secretary Yellen acknowledges the Congress will be required to enact significant domestic tax law changes in order to comply with the OECD agreement. Whereas prior administrations took the position the Treasury cannot bind Congress, this administration is using the global stage to attempt to, to, attempt to force Congress's hand. Senator Crapo and I have highlighted the significant infringement on comp congressional authority, but the administration is, unfortunately, prioritizing the OECD's demands. And that brings us to the announcement and to the agreement, excuse me, announced last week. In some way, there appears to be progress toward an agreement. For Pillar 2, countries have agreed to a global minimum tax rate of 15%, rejecting the Biden administration's hope for something higher. My view, uh, when the U.S. is self-sabotaging its own competition with one of the worst tax rates on the planet, foreign countries are certainly glad to oblige us. We also have additional color on the OECD's ambitious timeline for implementation. Model rules by year end, enactment by countries next year with the 2023 effective date. Yet, as Scott mentioned in the outset, many crucial questions remain unanswered. For a smart audience like this one, I don't have to go into detail explaining why the tax base matters as much, if not more, than the headline rate itself. That's one area of significant weakness in the Pillar 2 agreement. We know that many countries provide generous intellectual property box regimes, including our G7 partners like France, Italy, and the UK, as well as China and others. Not only does China have a corporate rate six percentage points lower than the House Democrats bill, but they also offer incentive rates for tech and software companies. Their special rates for startups, for example, including biotechnology, is as low as five or even zero percent. This means they can increase other nations' dependence on Chinese medical breakthroughs. I don't think anyone believes countries will simply roll back these special tax regimes to comply with the OECD. Instead, they are actively pursuing, and I believe will secure side agreements and carve-outs to protect their businesses and their workers uh, and to put U.S. companies and workers at a disadvantage. I'm also concerned about a critical question the OEC has failed to address. What happens when a country declines to implement the OECD agreement in a timely manner? Even more likely and problematic, what happens when a country subverts the agreement to serve its own interests? China and others have done so certainly in the trade space. Is there any doubt the same will happen on global taxes? Thus, Dispute resolution mechanisms must be clarified and strengthened. Countries that act in bad faith must be held accountable. And regarding pillar one, as with guilty grandfathering, I am disappointed to see the Biden administration walk back from demanding full and immediate repeal of digital services taxes targeted at Americans. Last week's agreement suggests a 2024 effective date for repeal of DSTs we can't allow discriminatory digital services taxes to remain in place for years 
while a final framework for Pillar 1 is developed and finally implemented. Countries with DSTs should demonstrate their good faith and suspend collection of the tax while the OECD process is completed. I'll close here. These global tax negotiations are important because they will help determine whether the United States will continue to innovate, prosper, and grow. I think to avoid another embarrassing surrender to our global competitors, the administration and Democrats here in Congress should, should, should sit down and engage with Republicans. We should work together to ensure the OECD agreement promotes American interests. You know, I believe our international tax system could be further improved in order to create more American jobs and prosperities. And as you know, from my position on these tax increases, I'm confident the Democrats' tax plans would do just the opposite. I worry through all these international tax discussions, then at the end of the day, Secretary Yellen will bring back to Congress an agreement that makes it better to be a foreign company worker than a US company or worker, and that we will be surrendering billions of dollars of our US tax base. In my view, that is an agreement Congress should not and cannot accept. Scott, with that, I'm glad to, to uh, take questions or comments, but most importantly, I wanna thank you for having me here today. Well, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. And I do have a, a real quick question before I turn it over to my colleague, um, Daniel Bunn for the first uh, panel. Have you, you uh, touching on the, one of the last points you made about the loss of US revenues uh, out of this process, have you seen any estimates from Treasury or any others on what either Pillar 1 or Pillar 2 could cost the United States in lost revenues as a, as a consequence of this deal? You know, the short answer is no. Secretary Yellen and I discussed this um, some time ago um, uh, on the heels of some independent estimates that America could lose up to $100 billion of tax of revenue over the next decade. You know, her view was that she believed, I mean, I'm not gonna to speak to her secretary, I, I respect her a great deal. Uh, she believed that uh, it would not be anywhere close to that. And uh, I'm hopeful they were uh, expected to send us some of the information that would back up that belief. We've not yet received it, I'm hopeful we will. Um, but my take on where the discussions are right now, I think makes it very likely we will, foreign countries are gonna require surrendering the US tax base to be part of this ultimate agreement. Well, thank you again for joining us. We have a global audience today, so uh, your comments were appreciated globally <laughs> and not just here in the United States. So thanks again. Um, we have an action-packed uh, program today and I really appreciate you kicking it off in such a thoughtful manner. My pleasure. Thanks, Scott. Take care. You bet. And Daniel, uh, we got a great panel to start out today's program, and uh, the floor is yours. I'm going to turn the program over to Daniel Bunn, our Vice President uh, for Global Programs here at the Tax Foundation, uh, to uh, host this uh, next panel. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Scott. So uh, if you've seen the agenda, you'll see that we've got a Pillar 1 session, a Pillar 2 session, and then a broader policy conversation going on. So we'll jump right into the Pillar 1 session. We have two presentations, um, one from Martin Simler, who's a um, research uh, uh, assistant at uh, the Oxford, um, Cin Oxford Center for Tax Policy. Sorry, I've got my words all mixed up in my head. Um, and then we have Lorraine Eden, who's a professor emerita of management at Mays Business School at Texas A&M. Um, we're gonna go ahead to uh, Martin's presentation and then Lorraine's presentation, and then we'll be joined by Lee Liu, who's a senior economist at the IMF, and Seamus Coffey, who is a lecturer in the Department of Economics at University College Cork in Ireland. Um, so Martin, I'll go ahead and pass it off to you um, to talk about who will pay amount A. Thanks so much, Daniel. And it, the center is called Center for Business Taxation. <laughs> I, apologize. To, I apologize. <laughs> no worries. It's kind of it's a tricky name. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for including uh, our work here. So I will talk about who will pay amount A. And the presentation will be based on a, on a joint policy brief I've written with Michael Devereux, uh, beginning of July, July, who has the same title. And so the idea of our policy brief was to say, can we give some insights on the number of companies uh, affected by pillar one and also the amount of 
profits that will be included into amount A. And what we know about these companies, so where are they located, in which industries they are active. And on top of that, we wanted to kind of illustrate um, certain policy choices in kind of designing these rules. So what is the impact of really excluding the financial sector? Why do we have a revenue threshold of 20 billion? What would it mean if we have a different one? And also kind of thinking about <clears throat> the profitability in definition. So I assume everybody knows what amount A is. <clears throat> And I'm just kind of going through the main details of the regulations, so really kind of high level details to emphasize what we do consider in our study and what we cannot consider in our studies. The amount A will be paid by multinational firms with revenues above 20 billion euro and pre-tax profits about 10% of revenues. We will assume because we cannot really observe that all firms that fulfill these criteria are multinational firms because we don't observe it. Uh, we will use pre-tax profits uh, coming from the consolidated financial statements. We will ignore that there might be some minor adjustments. And we also do a kind of a, a one-year analysis and ignore any dynamic um, dimension. There might be segmentation in some <clears throat> cases. We don't have the data for that, so we can also kind of not take this into account. Um, regulated financial services and extractives are excluded. So we don't really see who is regulated and who is not regulated. So we are assuming that all financial sector firms are regulated. And lastly, um, we are, or the amount A will be 25% of pre-tax profits of 10% of revenue. And it might be capped if the profits are already taxed in the market country. So this safe harbor, we also cannot take into account. And on top of that, since we have written the report beginning of July, we have used kind of a 20% quantum, um, but the difference is kind of, or you can easily calculate the 25% if you have to decide for the 20%, and I uh, will say something about this. And uh, In addition, if you look into the report, we have used in the report largely a revenue threshold of 20 billion US dollars, so the numbers that are included in the presentation might not exactly fit the ones in the report, just that you are aware of that. For our analysis, we use three different data sets because there is no perfect data set out there to kind of understand the questions we want to address. So our preferred data set is the Fortune Global 500. Um, this data set includes the 500 largest company groups around the globe based on revenues. <clears throat> and the main difficulty of this data set is that the smallest company has a revenue of about 26.3 billion, which is above the revenue threshold. So we complement this first data set with a second one which is Data Stream International. And this allows us really to include all public companies with revenues above 750 million euro. This is the threshold for pillar two. Um, but as I already mentioned, it only includes public companies. So it <coughs> um, misses out a few. And on the third data set we're using is always Europe. This is, allows us to focus on the profitability criteria because it gives us kind of data for public and private companies, but they are only kind of European companies. Let me walk you through our main results. <clears throat> so we start from the Fortune Global 500. So we have 500 companies. If we then exclude the financial sector and the extracted industry, you exclude about 25% of these 500 companies. And then a large chunk, so almost 60% are excluded because they have profits of less than 10% of revenue, which means out of this 500, about 78 would be subject we can do the same with the profits. So the aggregate profits of the top 500 companies is 2,600 billion. If we exclude the financial sector and the extractive industries, you go down to about uh, 1,400 billion. And if we then also exclude companies that have profits of less than 10% of revenue, we end up at these 80 companies that are subject or company groups that are subject to pillar one have profits of about 880 billion US dollar. And what we then have to exclude are the profits that equal 10% of revenue, which halves the profits. And then we take 20% of that. And so we end up with about 90 billion US dollar profits included into amount A. Since the smallest company in the top 500 has revenues above the threshold, what we do is we just guess, make an educated guess and say, okay, it's probably that there will be about 100 company groups uh, affected by pillar one, 
and about 100 billion US dollar profits included in amount A, assuming that this is really 20% of which is residual profits. So this is the calculation from kind of July. Um, when we use kind of our second data set, we end up with very similar results. So then we calculated our kind of 103 companies subject to pillar one and about 102 billion US dollar profits included into amount A. Since last Friday, we know that this quantum will not 20 be 20%, but 25% of which is profits. So since this is not really affecting the number of companies affected and their total profits, we can just say 25 over 20 times 100 is 125. So we expect that the amount A will include 125 billion US dollar profits if the quantum is 25%. And this is also the number the OECD has shared with us last week. And now we looked into kind of two different dimensions. So the first one really, where are these companies headquartered? And the table shows you here the top seven headquarter countries um, based on the relative contribution towards amount A. So the US companies headquartered in the US account for around two thirds of the amount A. The second is then China and Chinese companies account about 10% to amount A followed by Switzerland with about 6%, UK, Russia with about 4%, Ireland with 2%, and Germany is kind of last year with about 1.6%. And so the first striking thing is that <clears throat> around 80% of the amount A comes from companies headquartered in only three countries. Or if you take into account the first five countries, you would say almost 90% of amount A comes from companies headquartered in only five countries. And what's on top of that striking is that the US economy is certainly large, but I think it's, yeah, 60 or two thirds is, is way beyond the relative share of the economy. And so I put at least some kind of an additional comparison here, which is the share of revenues that uh, US companies kind of account for. So the relative share is about 30% and the amount A share is 60%. And the same is true for Switzerland, UK, Russia, and Ireland, that the amount A share is much larger relative to the revenue share. And the opposite is true for China and Germany. And what this is telling us is that the profitability of American, Swiss, UK, Russian, Ireland, Irish companies is above average, and the profitability of companies headquartered in China and Germany is below average. So the next dimension we looked at is the relative contribution by industry. Um, so the top contributing industry is kind of technology. So the industry classification is very unique for the Fortune Global 500. Um, this compromises technology, compromises manufacturing of computers, but also Google and so on. So technology companies account for about half of the amount A. It's then followed by healthcare, which is mainly pharmaceuticals with about 16%, um, energy 10%, <clears throat> food, beverages, and tobacco is 8%, and then retail, telecommunications, and industrials. And similar to the kind of the distribution by headquarter country, what you can see here again is that there's a strong concentration. So about three sectors, the three largest sectors contribute about 70% to the amount A, and if you take into account the five largest sectors, then you can end up with about 85%. And also similar to the country distribution, you have few sectors which really contribute most, in particular, relative to their revenue share. So the divergence between the revenue share and the amount A share is really strong for technology, healthcare, and food, beverages, and tobacco. And for retail, telecommunications, or industrial, it's, it's very, very similar. So if we look on these blue industries here, technology, healthcare, and food and beverages, we can understand <clears throat> why the country distribution is so uneven. So the US hosts almost all technology companies, 85%, and then it's only China and Taiwan. In the healthcare sector, the US is also accounts for almost two thirds, and in food, beverages, and tobacco, it's also 30%. And <clears throat> Switzerland, UK, and Ireland also show up, not with respect to the technology companies, but with respect to pharmaceuticals and food, beverages, and tobacco. So this is linking why there are some countries really overrepresented, but we have to explain now why are these sectors so badly hit by pillar one. 
And we believe this is all coming from the definition of residual profit, which links to revenue. So to illustrate this point, <coughs> I've kind of produced two tables here. So the first one is trying to understand what would happen if we would use not pretext profits over revenue, but pretext profits over equity. And um, the analysis relies only on the sample for the European firms. So we estimated for the initial or for the current proposal, uh, there would be about 33 European firms affected, and the amount A for them would be 20 billion US dollar. Now, to raise the same amount of revenue, but using pretax profits over equity, would require a threshold of about 12.5%. So you see the amount A is the same as 20 billion US dollar, but <clears throat> the number of companies affected would increase by more or less 50%. And to make this kind of even more clear that there are quite a few profitable companies, or companies that offer a reasonable return, but are not affected by this, the lower, table shows you the share of European companies that have revenues above 750 million euro, and also pre-tax profits over equity of above 10%. So and for all sectors, you have to add the 50 and the 29 together. So about 80% of the firms in our economy have pre-tax profits over equity above 10%. And this is also very similar if we just look on the manufacturing of computers, 27 plus 51 is also more or less 80, and manufacturing of food products, it's very similar again. But if we then split the overall group or the group that has pre-tax profits over equity into the subgroup that also has pre-tax profits over revenue above 10, we see that the share over all sectors is about 30 out of 80. Um, but if we just look into the manufacturing of computers, for example, the shares was 50 over 80, much, much larger. And if we then compare it to another manufacturing sector, because you could argue it might be related to manufacturing, we see that the manufacturing of food products only has kind of a share of companies that have revenue or pre-tax profits over equity above 10% and pre-tax profits over revenue above 10% is only 20 over 80. And so we believe <clears throat> is kind of using pretax profits over revenue targets a particular type of company and in particular the ones that use intangible assets or have a strongly knowledge base. Let me now come kind of to the last exercise we do. <clears throat> what happens if we change the revenue threshold? So this, and now this is based on the, on the second data set, so the data stream. Um, the baseline result is shown here in, in, the, in the first row. With a revenue threshold of 20 billion euro, there will be around 103 companies affected, and amount A will include 102 billion US. If we decrease the revenue threshold to 10 billion euro, the number of companies more or less doubles, a bit more than that, but amount A increases only by 35 to 40 percent. If we go down to 5 billion euro as a revenue threshold, we end up with about 452 companies affected and 172 billion US dollar in, included into the money. So what you can see here is that reducing the revenue threshold has a strong impact on the number of companies. And so we think about compliance costs, but it has a little impact or kind of a modest impact on the amount of profits included in the And just to give you an additional comparison here, so if we would assume that financial statements are comparable for the financial sector and the non-financial sector, which is a debate, then we could say, okay, we, what would happen if we include the financial sector? And what we calculate is that this would double the amount A and increase the number of companies by about 60%. So it would have a much stronger impact on the revenue or on the amount A than on the number of companies. So let me conclude. What we calculate in the paper is that around 100 company groups will be affected by pillar one, and that the amount A will include 125 billion US profits. So this is based on the quantum. What we also can show, we believe, is that pillar one affects disproportionately company groups in technology, healthcare, food, beverage, and tobacco, due to defining residual profits relative to revenues. And these companies are predominantly headquartered in the US. Switzerland, Ireland, and UK, which is the main reason why these countries contribute so much 
to a monet. Lastly, the reduction of the revenue threshold of the revenue threshold to 10 billion euro, which is kind of expected in seven, eight years' time, will have a modest impact on amount A profits, but it will more than double the number of company groups affected. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, now over to uh, Lorraine. And Lorraine, you're muted. Mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. And let's share. I think I'm sharing the screen. Yes, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, I can see it. Thank you. OK, let me. Um, um, say that I'm delighted to be here and, and um, look forward to the discussion today. And I enjoyed listening to the presentation uh, by Martin Simler and um, um, by Michael Devereaux. And let me say my, my own work on taxing the 100 gets to very much the same result. So I, I actually agree with all of their conclusions. The big difference between us, I think, is I started with the number, the top 100, and worked from the number backwards. And they started with the, um, the decision on how big the profits should be of the firms that we're in, and then estimated the amount of revenue that was raised. So I think the 100 billion that uh, they have here is, uh, is what I actually expected also to be. All right, let me uh, talk to um, my own work. Um, I realize that uh, today is October the 12th, and it was a year ago today, October the 12th, when the blueprints came down. So 365 days later, here we are looking at what's happened over the past year. Uh, when on October the 12th, which was Canadian Thanksgiving, by the way, I'm a Canadian by birth, uh, I picked up, as everyone else did, blueprints one and two, and pillar one and pillar two, and the economic impact assessment, read through them and looked at this and thought, okay, uh, Lorraine, what are you gonna focus on? And I thought to myself, well, everybody's gonna focus on pillar one and pillar two, and probably most people are gonna not gonna look at the economic impact assessment because that's really for economists and that's where the devil is. The devil's in the details in the economic impact assessment. So I decided on October the 12th to focus on the economic impact assessment and dissect it and see if I could figure out who really were the winners and losers from pillar one. Uh, amount A in particular. And what I realized was that the estimates, the OECD secretariat had not shared the total estimates of the winners and losers with all jurisdictions. Each jurisdiction got only its own data. So in other words, the US got the US data, France got the French data, Germany got the German data. And so there was no real helpful assessment of what was going to happen overall other than a couple of sort of pictures of what the net impact was going to be. And in the amount A formula, it's supposed to balance. So those countries that gain the so-called market jurisdictions just equal those countries that lose the so-called tax relieving jurisdictions. And the thing is basically a wash and very little money was raised. So I've really spent much of the last year trying to parse out whether that's the case. And what I'm here to sort of talk about today is why I think that is not the case, that actually this is a huge increase in the corporate income tax base. Uh, in other words, a big increase in the taxes on um, multinationals. So I've done seven pieces here. <laughs> You're welcome to look at them. And I'm just going to sort of quickly summarize them and then focus on the tax games piece. The formula um, we're all familiar with, it's two components. One, uh, amount A, that's the total Lorraine, amount that's raised. Excuse me, um, have you been yes. advancing your slides? We're still seeing the same starting slide. Okay, here, are you seeing the same slide now? Is it okay now, uh, Daniel? Um, we're just seeing the starting slide, uh, your first yeah. slide. Okay, let me see, uh, let me start there we go. the share. There we go. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna start the share again. Okay. That's probably the easiest. Are you seeing it now? Yes, I see the formula. Yep. And it's moving. Okay. There we go. Right. We're Thank moving. You. Sorry. Thank you. I've got three screens here. So the I'm moving on the wrong one, I guess. So my point in saying is the formula is quite straightforward. It's made of a global part, which is the total pie. 
and the allocation that goes to each piece of the pie. Um, if you look at the total amount, what you heard, and you heard that very much in Martin's presentation, what matters is who's in scope, what the global profit threshold is going to be, what the residual profit threshold is going to be, and what the allocation percent is going to be. So if you start varying those numbers, obviously that changes the, the size of the pie. And so the first thing was, um, if you look at what was in the economic impact assessment, for example, on component B, the reallocation to markets, where investment hubs lose 2% of global corporate income tax revenues. If you double the reallocation percent, you double the amount that investment hubs lose. This is pretty straightforward, right? The second insight I had was what really matters here, if you wanna look at each individual jurisdiction and what it gains and loses, you need to look at what I've called the C minus E gap. The C is the GIDs, the global in scope sales, of a jurisdiction and the GIDS is the global in scope profits of that jurisdiction. So the third, and I'll come back to that in a minute. The third insight I had in playing with the formula was that it really is sales-based formulary apportionment. That if you, if you look at the formula, you hold the tax rate the same, what really matters is the average worldwide return on sales, ROS, compared to the average return on sales of that particular M&E in your jurisdiction. Anytime you have above, profit, above normal profitability, in other words, the multinationals earn above the world average, they are going to have to give up tax base. Anytime they're below, they're going to lose tax base. So in other words, the winners here are stagnant economies where the average return on sale in that jurisdiction is below the uh, world average, and so they're going to gain tax base from amount A. Dynamic jurisdictions, for example, like in the United States, where the average return on sale is above the world average, are actually going to have to give up tax base. And so that helps you think about who's going to win and who's going to lose. If you look across my papers, what you see is me starting out originally to do exactly what the economic impact assessment is. Same picture, same tables, here, here's one, for example, calculated for investment hubs, showing from a residence perspective and from a source perspective, who the winners and who the losers are going to be looking at investment hubs, uh, high income jurisdictions, middle income jurisdictions, low income jurisdictions. And here's another picture showing the same thing where I'd actually looked at high income Americas. I was trying to get at Canada and the US and I could actually predict from a residence and source perspective of what the C minus E gap was going to be and then figure out what that meant in terms of tax base. And then I finally had an, someone asked me, tell me what's going to happen for the US. And I had an aha moment where I said, okay, the best source of data on foreign source income of multinationals is the BE data. And so I called Ray Mataloni <laughs> at the BEA, and um, we talked about how one would proxy component C and component E in terms of BEA data. And what I realized from looking at this is this is kind of back where I started. The OECD gave each country its own data. So it got two arrows in the matrix. It got one arrow for its own multinationals as a residence jurisdiction, out, outward foreign direct investment, and one arrow is an inward jurisdiction, foreign multinationals in that country. And I was able using BEA data to actually predict who was going to win and who was going to lose uh, on here. And it turns out, not surprisingly, American multinationals lose, in, lose big time in Europe, all right? And then they're gonna to have to give up tax base. And on the other hand, in the United States, what you show here is that European multinationals are actually very profitable in the United States. You're going to have to give up tax base. Uh, so I did this also at in terms of the various types of industries. And you see in this one, financing insurance and, na and natural, excuse me, and natural resources are in. Financing insurance is very profitable. And so under a, um, taxing the 100 top multinationals, they would clearly be in the top group here. Take them out. And the next big category that's going to be in is ADS and manufacturing industries. All right, so 
given the sort of how this system works, what the sort of simple analytics of the formula are, let me talk about some of the games that can be played. And uh, Kevin Brady mentioned his concern about playing tax games as affecting the amount of revenue. Remember, this thing is supposed to basically balance those who receive just equal those who give up. And the only real difference is supposed in amount A is supposed to come from differences in corporate income tax rates. What I talked about is the indirect impact. The direct impact should basically balance here if this is done right. But multinationals can affect the amount of amount A tax they pay. How? One, lobby to not be included. And clearly we saw all kinds of examples of that. Finance and insurance is out, natural resource industries are out. I think there's a pretty good likelihood that state-owned multinationals are out, many of whom will, of course, be Chinese natural resource uh, MNEs, will be excluded from amount A. Second thing is you need to affect the amount of global in-scope profits that you pay in a jurisdiction or in, affect the global in-scope destination-based sales in that jurisdiction. And there are ways you can both reduce the amount of profits you have and raise the amount of your share of sales or lower the amount of share of your sales. I think multinationals will do what they've always wanted to do, always have been doing, is maximize global profits after tax. So they will therefore manipulate amount A so as to reduce the amount A tax they pay. And they can do that through transfer pricing, through inbound and outbound uh, transactions as easily as they uh, could before. So I think the types of tax games, they'll be different games, but they can be played. And we see those already in the United States in terms of the state-based corporate income tax base and the sharing here. Now, let me talk about governments. Governments have a real incentive here to, I think, also manipulate the system. One, if I'm a so-called tax relief, base relief, receiving jurisdiction, I want more base. And if I'm a tax base relieving, I don't want to pay it. I don't want to give it up. Okay, hang on. All right. How can I do that? I can increase my share of GIDs. That, that's C, raise component C. I can lower component E. Now remember component E is about defining global in scope, global residual in scope profits. And so there's abilities to affect that, all right? I can also, if there's no nexus there, no permanent establishment there, of course, this is ADS sales, that creates an automatic gain for a market jurisdiction. So the key thing I think that happens here is it really matters who's actually gonna provide the tax base relief. And that's when I, um, I started really started wondering who provides the tax base relief. This picture is out of the brand new um, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 um, thing that was released uh, the other day on the two pillar solution. This picture is in here. Notice it only shows who receives. There's no picture here of who pays. Matter of fact, the only picture it shows of who pays are multinationals paying. It doesn't show any jurisdictions paying tax. And my, my, my actual underlying belief is this picture is accurate. There will be countries receiving tax base, large numbers of them, pretty well all of them, because Nexus is very close to zero. For the smallest countries, it's only 250,000, I don't remember if it's euros or pounds, but it's, it's, it's peanuts, it's very small. And so who will end up paying here is the MNE. To find that out, I went back to chapter seven in the blueprint on October the 12th. And if you look at that blueprint, there's a four step relieving process that identifies who pays. Bottom of the line of this profit is that who pays depends upon who has the functions, assets and rest and who has the DEMPI intangibles here. It's very fuzzy. And basically it goes from saying, number one, let's look at your activity. Two, let's look at your profitability. Three, let's find who's connected. And four, all else fails. Let's just go after a pro rata allocation. Uh, in other words, I've heard this called the waterfall method. And what I'm hearing now is that is actually the current proposal is number four, the backstop route, which is just go after a pro rata allocation of all countries of having to, of having to pay this. So th this is a very fuzzy, proposal, and it's no clearer in the two-pillar one that was just released. 
And what it leads to is a variety of tax gains. Now, in trying to figure out how those worked, what I did is I went back to the back of the, of the Pillar 1 blueprint, and there's a couple of examples there of figuring out how this works in a centralized multinational and a decentralized multinational. And in the centralized multinational, what you do find is amount A, the net impact is zero. It's just a wash. Tax base relief just act equals tax base received. In a decentralized multinational, if there's no tax gains, same thing. The direct impact of amount A is a wipe. Those who gain just equal those who receive. But if you go to this one, where you start playing tax games, either through the multinationals pay, playing those games or through the tax authorities playing those games and refusing to provide relief, what happens is the global tax base collected around the world in a pandemic where GDP is many countries not rising uh, is going to significantly rise. We already know uh, foreign direct investment flows are down. A big increase in tax, I think, is going to have that impact. So let me go to my last point and then I'll stop. When I started looking at this and thinking, okay, how is this going to work in terms of who pays? I realized that the whole thing kind of ignored whether countries were already taxing foreign source income, whether we were on a territorial or a worldwide tax system. In a territorial system, a residence-based country taxes stop at the water's edge. They don't tax the income of their own multinationals from foreign source income. Now, the US is basically on a territorial tax system. There is guilty, so we do get some tax from guilty. Uh, clearly, pillar two will also provide some possible tax. But in general, absent guilty, absent globe, amount A ignores the fact that in effect, territorial tax jurisdictions at the residence level have already given up. They exempt foreign source income. So who does get corporate income tax base? source jurisdictions. Who do they get it from? Foreign multinationals in their country. In other words, from the US, if I had to ask who's getting tax base uh, on, on offshore activities, the US is not getting much revenue on its own multinationals. Its revenue is coming from foreign multinationals in the United States, particularly European ones, which were very profitable. And let me flip it from the U European point of view. Most of Europe's on the territorial tax system. Where's their offshore corporate income tax base coming from? Foreign m and And who in particular? American multinationals. So is it not surprising the Europeans are pro amount A in the sense that they get to tax American multinationals, which are very profitable. The United States is looking at European multinationals as potentially being a source of revenue. So my view here is, Source jurisdictions are already taxing foreign multinationals in their midst. They're the ones that are going to be asked to provide tax relief, and they're not going to want to give up the base they already have. Basically, we are asking Congress to give up taxing foreign multinationals, Canadian, European, Japanese, Chinese multinationals that have subsidiaries here and are paying tax revenue here. The corporate income tax base in the United States goes down if we stop taxing foreign MNEs here. There's no incentive to do that. And if we don't, then we get double taxation. And that, in effect, becomes a trade related investment measure, a trim, uh, which are basically trims are illegal under the WTO. I also think large players will engage in tit for tat retaliation, Europe and the United States. If the US continues to tax European MNEs in the US, Europe continues to tax American multinationals in Europe, there will be trade warfare, tit for tat retaliation here. Small countries, Canada, <laughs> get sideswiped here when large countries engage in tit for tat retaliation. Prospect theory tells you if I was already taxing you, and you drop out of the tax one, the top 100 for a particular reason, I'm going to still continue to try to tax you. I'm not going to give up that tax base easily. So for all of these reasons, I think there's a real problem here. Um, governments are not going to be identified as tax relieving. 
multinationals are not going to want to pay additional tax. What's the proposal that we just got in the two pillar solution? I discussed it in my taxing the 100. I didn't think it was going to happen, but here we have it written in the October uh, 8 brand new two pillar solution. What is the proposed solution? A new multilateral convention, mandatory binding arbitration, and a single entity that's going to run the whole thing. I called that uh, what I learned in welfare economics when I was a PhD student. Uh, the, the omniscient benevolent dictator, the OM, the OBM, the omniscient benevolent dictator. So I think in reality, what we end up with is a two layer system where we have the international tax regime layered on top of pillar one, double taxation coming. I think the 100 billion that, uh, that was estimated by Martin and uh, Mike Devereaux is accurate. That 100 billion is primarily going to fall on multinationals Whose multinationals is going to primarily for the US, it's going to fall on US MEs because they are the bulk in those industries. If you take finance and insurance and natural resource industries out, that leaves ADS and all manufacturing industries primarily in scope. We've changed the nexus definition from being a PE definition that was broadened under BEPS 1 into a definition that all you need is $250 million in sales and you have nexus. I think there were much better ways that we could have handled taxing multinationals in the digital economy. I actually think amount A is a bad deal and it's a bad deal all around. It's a political deal, not a principal deal. Globe pillar two, I'm more positive on when we may talk about that later. Anyway, I thank you very much. I appreciate uh, you listening to me. Thanks, Lorraine. Um, and we'll we'll go ahead and move to um, uh, bring in uh, Seamus and Lee here. Um, I'm going to uh, just uh, give them the, the floor for a moment. We'll start with Lee and then go to Seamus, and then we'll see if we have time for other questions or, um, or discussion. Um, but Lee, go ahead. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, just a quick disclaimer, all views here are my personal views and not the IMF. So just two quick um, summary. These are really nice pair to improve our standing on amount A. I enjoy reading them both. So basically in terms of which multinationals would pay, where would the residual profits come from and where would they go? Um, it's very assuring that despite um, the two papers use very different data sets. So Martin and Mike focusing on global multinationals using their consolidated financial statements and Lorraine looking into US multinationals with the BEA data. Um, some of the main takeaways are quite similar. So what have we learned from these two presentations? Uh, well, I think the big message is that the amount of residual profit or amount A is highly concentrated. So in around 100 largest companies, um, in mainly US owned multinationals, followed by Chinese multinationals, and in a few industries. So high tech included, but also more traditional sectors such as pharmaceutical and retail. Um, we also learned that expanding the scope of amount A in various dimensions would have differential impact on the revenue potential. So for example, by excluding financial sector, um, lowering the re revenue threshold or increasing the profitability threshold, um, I quite like that Mike and Martin are teasing a very interesting question in their paper. Uh, what should be used as a proxy to determine residual and fundamentally uh, normal returns based on the underlying economic theory? And I will be very interested to hear their thoughts. So all these exercises to me seem like a thought experiment about the revenue potential of amount A should the scope expand in the long run? So now in terms of revenue impact, we heard from both presentations, it is going to be quite limited. So amount A would raise in total about half percent of current global CIT revenue, which is about one tenth the revenue potential of pillar two. Well, I guess this is probably not the main charm of pillar one, um, as the new taxing right is indeed a break from outdated norms. So in that way, I'm slightly more positive than Lorraine. Um, so the new revenue 
will likely benefit many countries, including many developing countries that are destination countries and are currently collecting very little or no revenue from multinationals, uh, which would be the main countries to lose as Lorraine's analysis show would be the investment hubs. So all these revenue gains would come at the expense of residence country, which would need to give a credit or exam for this profit, especially the US. And last, perhaps it's also worth noting beyond amount A, in terms of the overall revenue impact of pillar one. One, uh, revenue gains are likely to be smaller due to behavior responses, not only from governments, but also from multinationals. So outside amount one, uh, the incentives for profit shifting would remain for multinationals and the pressures for tax competition would also stay to some extent. There would also be some revenue gains from amount B for source countries, which is especially relevant for low-income countries. Now, uh, DST. So DST would need to go, not only for in-scope multinationals, but for all multinationals. So these are likely to benefit US multinational, but not so much for the US government. So for some countries, the revenue impact would be the net of the two. So with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thanks so much, Lee. Uh, Seamus, maybe some quick reactions from you. Uh, thanks very much, um, and thanks for the two speakers for, for the very interesting presentation. I suppose, from my perspective, it's sort of like the interface uh, between the US and Ireland uh, because of, of the presence of US companies in Ireland, uh, the functions, assets, and risks they have here, uh, the profit, profits they declare in Ireland, and the tax they pay in Ireland. Uh, and Pillar 1 uh, does provide sort of an interesting, sort of, as I say, interface between the two. Uh, in the initial analysis that, that Martin was providing, we clearly saw that um, the largest share of companies and the largest share of profits, uh, and maybe outside in terms of the, the share of profits, would be from US headquartered companies. Uh, but many of those that have operations in Ireland and a large share of those profits uh, would already be declared in Ireland. Uh, so I think when it comes to, to Pillar A from an Irish perspective, and the question Scott said at the start about who are the winners and who are the losers, uh, the view in Ireland is that under um, Pillar 1, Ireland would certainly be a loser. It's a very small country, um, only 5 million people, but has large companies with very large exporting operations. Uh, so the customers are somewhere else. So if more and more of the profit is to be taxed on the basis of customers, as, as Lorraine has uh, elicited, then you're looking at more of that um, profit being taxed somewhere else. So even though Ireland actually signed up to this, uh, the Pillar 1 relatively easily, much more the debate on Ireland is about Pillar 2, the rate, uh, it is clear that it, it would cost uh, Ireland something, and it would be mainly U.S. companies. So you might have analysis suggesting uh, U.S. headquartered companies, uh, many of those losses could actually be in Ireland because of the, the functions, assets, risks, and maybe even some of the DEMPI functions and intangible assets uh, that those companies have in Ireland. And even in, in Martin's suggestion about looking at the Irish headquartered companies, uh, I'd imagine many of those are also actually US companies and uh, that have inverted uh, and moved their, their, their notion at least headquarters to Ireland. Uh, they would in fact be uh, have most of their activities in the US. Uh, I doubt there would be many Irish owned or, or Irish MNCs that, that would come under the, the remit of the, the amount. A. When looking at the, the interaction of it with uh, other factors, the amounts to be invo involved in Ireland are, are difficult to ascertain. We have some estimates of the overall amounts here, but our own Department of Finance uh, have said that Ireland could potentially lose two billion to two and a half billion euro of corporate tax revenue. What does that mean in international context? Well, that would be about one percent of Ireland's national income, uh, and one percent of national income is a very significant amount, uh, and it's a potential risk for, for Ireland uh, of a loss of tax revenue under the, the calculations uh, as they are set out. As I said, most of the debate in Ireland has been on uh, the rate and pillar two, but I actually think the more fundamental changes uh, are actually when it comes to, to pillar one, sort of the, the rewriting of the rules uh, for how companies are taxed. Uh, and if some of the taxing rights goes based on the location of customers or market, con market countries, that's rewriting rules we've had for 100 years. Ireland has benefited uh, from those rules. And I think many of the risks from an Irish perspective are linked to um, amount takes. If you look at the corporation tax paid in Ireland, about 62 thirds of it is paid by American companies. Ireland is perhaps unusual in global terms where more corporate tax is paid by foreign companies 
than by indigenous or, or domestic companies. And if you look at the IRS country by country data, Ireland is one of the largest recipients of corporate tax from US companies. So when it comes to working out who may be the loser, uh, I think there'll be clear shifting of the, um, the, the profits of, or the taxing rights to the profits of US multinationals, but much of that could come from Ireland. Thanks so much, Seamus. Um, what, one question um, that I'm thinking about looking at the presentations from Martin and Lorraine, and then your quick reactions, Lee and Seamus. Um, uh, I'm thinking of the compliance challenge of figuring out where, as a multinational, you're reallocating profits from. Um, is there incentive built into this from a compliance and complexity perspective to minimize, change your corporate structure to minimize the number of jurisdictions you might be reallocating from? So maybe you you know move um, IP assets to one jurisdiction so you know where all your residual is, um, or maybe you already have that kind of arrangement. Um, but I'm trying to think of what sort of you know beyond the games that Lorraine was talking about, what sort of um, adjustments there might be. Um, quick responses, and then we'll wrap up this session. Uh, just to take that, that briefly, maybe I, I think in the main a lot of U.S. companies have already done that. Um, up to recently, they'd have had that their IP and licenses located maybe in, in no tax jurisdictions like uh, the Cayman Islands or Bermuda or perhaps have arranged stateless structures uh, where the, their key sort of main uh, license would have been centralized. Over the last few years, of course, that has changed. We've seen some companies move IP to the likes of Ireland. So it has remained centralized and had significant gross IP profits being declared in Ireland. Of course, many other companies have announced that they have uh, return their IP back into the US. Uh, so I think maybe from a, a compliance perspective, the companies already want to keep things simple uh, and do want to have sort of a centralized uh, base of things. And they do want operations in, in, in several countries, like where, where even where companies have their customers, they will have service operations. I think when it comes to the profits and maybe the profit to be allocate, reallocated via uh, amount aid, there already, already is a good amount of centralization and, and relative simplification there. None of this is simple. Yes, relative simplification, of course. Um, thank you so much. Sorry to rush the ending here, but thank you to Martin and Lorraine for some um, great presentations and some provocative um, data points. Um, I'm going to uh, go into, a, we're gonna go into a break. Um, and then five minutes from now, Will Morris is going to start the session on pillar two. Um, so see everybody back in five.
Well, welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, say how much I enjoyed the panel one, the uh, pillar one presentation, uh, while at the same time resisting the temptation to do what I want to do, which is to give extensive comments on pillar one. I'll, uh, I will resist that, I promise you. So we have a great panel here uh, on pillar two. Um, uh, I'll do very brief introductions, although they're not really needed. Um, Mike Devereaux is a professor at Oxford, you all know that, um, director of the Center for Business Taxation, uh, previously at Warwick. Most importantly for these purposes, he's the founding director of the European Tax Policy Forum, clearly the most prestigious thing on his uh, on his uh, resume, uh, CV. Um, but uh, Mike has been working now uh, with me at ETPF for uh, <clears throat> 15 years plus, uh, and in that time has helped produce 50, uh, at least 50 uh, academic papers, um, some of which have um, uh, had considerable significance and have been written by some of the people who've been part of uh, the Pillar 1 and the Pillar 2 panels today. We also have Cody Callum. Uh, Cody is a resident fellow at Tax Foundation um, and uh, a PhD student, although he um, punches above his weight on, uh, on this one. He's done some great work uh, on estimating um, uh, Pillar 2 uh, amounts. And then we have two great commentators. Uh, we have uh, Lily Falhaber from uh, Georgetown, where she's a professor of law and associate dean. Uh, uh, she got uh, time off for good, for good behavior after doing uh, a couple of years at the OECD with Beth. Uh, we have Jennifer Bluin, uh, who is um, a professor of financial management and a professor of accounting uh, at uh, Wharton, uh, and has also spent a lot of time, um, uh, you know, slightly more from the accounting side rather than the legal side, um, but very well informed on both, I promise you, uh, looking at, at some of these international tax issues and looking uh, in particular at the OECD project. Uh, over the past couple of years. So uh, as you know, um, and as a number of the, the speakers in, in panel one said, um, we, we got um, uh, eight-ish pages uh, on, uh, uh, on Friday. Um, they don't, doesn't greatly expand what we know. Obviously, they, they fixed on 15%. I think that was probably the world's worst kept secret, um, uh, as opposed to at least 15%. Um, but still a great deal more than that we don't know. We can begin to see, however, Nevertheless, still some of the difficulties of how one would estimate this, the carve-outs, um, the quote-unquote formulaic substance-based carve-outs, you can pass the language there, um, uh, have clearly grown um, both in relation to tangible assets and in relation to payroll. Uh, there are indications from certain countries, Ireland, for example, that actually there's more in there um, that we don't know about in relation to R&D, for example. Um, there are uh, larger exceptions for startup entities. There's a delayed date for the UTPR. All of this makes estimating pillar two uh, difficult. That said, uh, both Mike and Cody and uh, Mike and Martin actually, and a, a group of other people from Oxford uh, have given this their best shot. Um, Mike is not going to talk um, so much about the mechanics of estimating pillar two as the potential impacts of pillar two will have on location decisions. Those of you who know about Mike know that he is um, essentially the uh, in inventor of uh, this part of um, uh, economics and tax with uh, effective average tax rates and marginal tax rates. Uh, and looking at location decisions is a crucial part of that. Cody uh, has more of the, the mechanics of estimating this uh, and with a model which can be adjusted as we find out more, as we assume we will, uh, at the end of November uh, in terms of determining what this is. The number which is now attached to this is 150 billion a year. Um, that is uh, quite substantial. Uh, there are parts of that which are actual revenue raised. There are parts of it which are, as with something like US subpart F, uh, essentially behavioral uh, in the sense that they would prevent income uh, from shifting uh, to another country. So with that, let me stop, um, unusually for me, uh, and um, relatively briefly and hand over to Mike. And Mike, I think you have some slides. I'm not sure who's uh, going to put them up, but uh, there we go. So Mike, over to you. Okay, uh, thanks. Can you see those slides? We can. Okay, right, thank you. Um, uh, thanks very much for uh, that introduction. So this is uh, one of those papers commissioned by the European Tax uh, Policy Forum, one of the, of the many that we'll spoke about, and is looking at a very specific aspect of Pillar 2, uh, in particular uh, business location decisions. Uh, and I should say this is a paper jointly written with Francois Barres and Irem Gucheri. So um, what do we actually ask? So what we're really interested in is, you know, let's assume that Pillar 2 is introduced and it all works. So, you know, we're economists, so we can assume that all the kind of difficult problems have been solved and it's actually going to work. 
Um, and if it does, what will happen to firm location decisions? And by the way, profit shifting, because we need to think about profit shifting in the context of firm location decisions. And really what we're doing is, is looking at this from the perspective of the, of the kind of global dictator, which Lorraine was talking about earlier. If we're thinking about, you know, what's the optimal position for the world? Um, and, you know, from an economic perspective, what we would like is that taxes should uh, not distort business location decisions. Um, so, you know, we have this notion in uh, economics of capital export neutrality, you know, commonly misunderstood, but it basically says that, you know, if I'm trying to make, uh, I'm trying to make a decision as to where to locate a new investment, uh, I would like, you know, from a global perspective, we'd like that not to be distorted by tax systems. I should go to, you know, that location, which is best for economic reasons rather than for tax reasons. And, you know, the closer we get to that, the closer we get to capital export neutrality, and the kind of smaller the welfare costs. So why are we looking at this in the context of pillar two? Because there is some economic literature out there which suggests um, that, uh, well, I think both directions, one that pillar two will actually kind of worsen uh, this position. And that's on the grounds that, and I suppose actually all profits are shifted to a tax haven, then nobody's paying any tax and we have capital export neutrality, quite extreme case. We don't actually believe that's, that's true, but you know, the closer we get to that, actually the closer we are to capital export neutrality. On the other hand, you know, if you have a minimum tax rate, which is broadly applied everywhere, that would get us close to capital export neutrality as well. So it's not actually obvious which, you know, when we introduce pillar two at different levels of threshold, whether it's going to get us closer to capital export neutrality or further away from capital export neutrality. And what this paper is trying to do, which I'll um, set out rather briefly, is to, is to um, try and think through that and try and figure out which direction it goes in. And my answer is it's going to go in both directions, actually, um, simultaneously. Um, so what we're really going to look at is we're going to look at effective average tax rates, which is you know, what the literature thinks you know, really determines uh, location decisions, or at least the effect of taxation on uh, location decisions. And, and if we actually see a dispersion in effective tax rates, that's also going to tell us something about tax competition. No, so to the extent to which tax rates in countries get closer to each other, or effective tax rates get closer to each other, then that, that means that there's going to be less tax competition in a sense because tax is going to distort location decisions less. And we need to take profit shifting into account. So what do we do? We take, you know, what we'll mention what's now a kind of standard approach in the economic literature. And this is, so this is looking at effective tax rates, not as measured as you know, going to financial accounts and looking at the tax number and dividing by a profit number, but rather looking at hypothetical investment. Um, so we think of an investment and we figure out how much tax that investment is going to pay based on you know, the standard parameters of the statutory tax system, like the tax rate, uh, allowance rates, you know, other features of the tax system and so on. Um, so that's that's what the kind of standard approach does, and that's how we get from like a measure of the statutory tax rate to what we call an effective average tax rate. So I and the EATR is not quite the same as a, a kind of financial measure of the effective tax rate. I'll come on to that in just a moment. We, but we then extend extend that because you know we're actually very interested in profit shifting in this context because the whole point of it is is really to do with profit shifting. Um, so. Uh, we are going to we're going to think of a of a multinational company which may locate its real activity in one of many countries. We're looking at OECD countries, but it may shift some of its profits to uh, to be you know to keep it simple to a zero rate jurisdiction. And we're going to use the consensus estimate in the economics literature of you know how much profit shifting there's going to be. So that is you know we're going to take this this estimate of a, what's known as a semi elasticity of 0 0.8, which says that um, if the tax rate if the tax rate goes up by ten percentage points, then re reported profit will go down by eight percent. Um, so, based on on an economic model, we have that also gives us an idea of what the costs of profit shifting are. So that's that's basically what we're doing. Actually, to model pillar two properly, we also have to estimate what the effective tax rate is. That's the fi financial effective tax rate. Um, but we make some simplifying assumptions to put that into our model. So here's basically what we're doing. We have a parent company, could be anywhere. It's thinking of investing either in country A or in country B. Whichever it does, it's going to shift some of its profits, you know, a relatively small part uh, to a tax haven effectively uh, 
which country X, which has got a zero rate. And the, the main measure that we're going to think about when we are the parent is making that choice as to whether to go to A or B is an effective tax rate, but we're going to add on to that some costs of profit shifting as well. So that's going to offset some of the gains from profit shifting. So that's that's the basic idea. It's a very simple model. You know, apologies to anybody out there who thinks that the world is much more complicated than this. Um, but to try and make some headway, we have to make some simplifications. So that's what we do. So what does this look like? Well, I have um, quite what looks like quite a complicated diagram for France as an example here. And I will just take you through this briefly to and show you, tell you what all these different lines mean. Um, the ones that you know we're going to focus on are the ones in the middle, actually. But let's let's start. The there's a what we're modeling here is a you know a number mostly different kinds of tax rates. But the blue line, which is going down as we move to the right, is the there's an ambulance going by as well, which I may you may have heard. Um, is is how much profit is going to be shifted out of uh, this? Is this is we're thinking of a parent which is investing in France, so there's some kind of subsidiary in France. It's going to be shifting some profit and the proportion it's going to be shifted is going to be given by this blue line so as we, as we move from left to right we are thinking of introducing pillar two but the threshold is going to start at zero then to 10 percent 20 percent and so on so the 15 percent is going to be right in the middle of this diagram um, so if we look at just the far left of this diagram you know we're at the point before pillar two is introduced so right at the top, we have the statutory tax rate in France, which is about 32 percent. Uh, the, the one below that, uh, the kind of browny yellowy line is the standard measure of the effective average tax rate. That's what you know, we would normally use to think about the incentives to invest in France, taking into account not only the statutory tax rate, but you know, other features of the French tax system. So that's where we start. Um, at that point, you know, on the estimates that I've just been speaking about, we'd expect actually about a quarter of that profit to be shifted to a tax haven. Um, you know, I've picked France because it's got a relatively high rate and so there's a relatively big incentive to shift profits. And as we do that, um, that actually going to reduce the effective tax rate uh, because you know, we're, we're no longer all being taxed in France. Some of it is, is be, being shifted to a zero rate uh, tax haven. Um, and so the uh, point at which we get to is about 20%. So in a, an effective tax rate after profit shifting is going to be about 20%. Um, so we then have three lines. As we let's then suppose we're going to increase, the th we're going to introduce the minimum tax and increase the threshold slowly as we move to the right. And as the threshold moves to the right, then in, in effect, this uh, subsidiary in the tax haven, which is facing a zero rate, is now going to be hit by. Uh, pillar two by the global minimum tax at an increasing rate. So in effect, we are no longer shifting profits to a place where we pay zero. We're shifting profits to a place where we pay 1% or 2% and so on up to 10, 20 and 30%. And as we do that, of course, the benefits of profit shifting are reduced. And that's why we see this blue line going down. You know, the, we are going to shift less and less profit as pillar two gets a higher and higher threshold. And as we do that, these three lines are the effective tax rates faced by the parent if it locates in France, and those all go up, and they go up because there's less profit shifting. Um, so the, the red line is our estimate of the financial effective tax rate. The green line is the, this, this the standard effective average tax rate as adjusted for profit shifting. And this, and this kind of bluey line is that effective tax rate plus the cost of profit shifting. So what do we find? You know, those all start going up. They don't go at that much in effect. Um, at some point, we get to a threshold which is so high, 26% or something, where actually pillar two starts applying to France as well. Um, and so there's no point in shifting profits any further. Um, so that's France. Let me just show you what uh, that compared with, for example, Ireland, which is a much lower tax rate. So what we have here in this diagram is, is basically the same these two upper uh, lines are the position for France that we've just looked at. The purple line is the effective tax rate. The kind of greeny line is the effective tax rate plus the cost of profit shifting. And these lines down here are the same, but for Ireland. 
So when we get to about a threshold of about 11%, this is with Ireland still at 12.5%, then Ireland becomes subject to pillar two as well, at which point the effective tax rate in Ireland starts going up with the threshold. This is like a 45 degree line as the threshold increases, so the tax rate in Ireland also increases. So this diagram kind of summarizes, you know, what we find in the model really. And that is to say, uh, at relatively low uh, threshold rates, actually there's a bigger effect on effective tax rates in high tax countries than in low tax countries. You can see that these effective average tax rates in, in France are actually going up faster than the effective tax rates <clears throat> in, in Ireland. And that's because there's more profit shifting going on from France because it's got a high tax rate. And so as we reduce the profit shifting, the effective tax rates in France go up. So actually what we're seeing in this, uh, over this range to the left-hand side is that the dispersion between France and, uh, Italy, uh, France and Ireland is actually getting bigger at that point. When we get a bit higher under the threshold and, we've, and Ireland itself becomes, uh, to, uh, becomes below the threshold and we start applying pillar two to, to Ireland itself, then the effective tax rate in Ireland starts going up much more rapidly. So over the next part, as the threshold is much higher, then actually the dispersion between France and uh, Ireland actually gets smaller. Okay, so let's look at that. For all OECD countries, you know, if you kind of pick any one of these kind of symbols, we have a whole set of OECD countries with very much the same pattern as we've just seen there for France and Ireland. France and Ireland are two of the extremes on this diagram. What do we find overall then? You know, as we have the same kind of picture here, this is the average uh, effective average tax rate, including costs of profit shifting and the average amount of profit shifted. As we start with no, no pillar two at all, and then in, introducing pillar two at an um, increasing threshold rate, you can see that the average, effective average tax rate starts going up but it doesn't go at that much um, on, on average. Profit shifting does come down quite substantially. So even at a 15% rate, you know, it's come down by about half, roughly, some, something of that order. Um, what we're mostly interested in here, though, you know, thinking about optimal tax systems is what are the dispersion of, of, of effective tax rates across countries? You know, as I said, you know, a, a capital export neutrality would want that dispersion to be zero. So this is a, we're now measuring the standard deviation across all OECD countries. What we'd like that, you know, from a global perspective, we'd like that to be as small as possible. And what we see, which, you know, with translating from that France and Ireland diagram is actually that's happening everywhere. So for the first part, as, as we introduce the minimum tax, but at a relatively low threshold, that has a bigger impact on the effective tax rates in high tax countries than low tax countries that actually increases the dispersion. So we see this measure of this dispersion, the standard deviation actually going up. What I have, all the different lines here are just kind of different estimates of how much profit shifting that there is. So my central estimate is somewhere in the middle there for, from the ones that I was using before. This is just showing that it actually works, you know, actually for pretty much any estimate of uh, profit shifting. And then at some point, you know, the minimum tax rate becomes so high, it starts catching up with the low tax countries like Ireland and other low tax countries. And then we actually get a, a reduction in the dispersion. So we have a shape where the, the standard deviation, the dispersion kind of goes up for a bit and then starts coming down a bit. And if we get to a very high threshold of 30%, then we actually get close to capital export neutrality again. So that's, the, that's it, that's the story. Um, so if pillar two works as intended, assuming away all the problems that we could spend, you know, many days talking about, let alone a single hour, um, the dispersion of effective average tax rate starts going up and then comes down. Actually, at 15 percent, we're back back where we started. So a threshold of about 15 percent, we're back where we started. And so, you know, in terms of overall economic efficiency, I'd say that's largely affected, unaffected. What I haven't said anything about is, you know, the cost of capital. Generally, you know, obviously companies are paying more in tax. The cost of capital is going to rise. So there's clearly going to be a negative effect on uh, investment overall. And clearly, as I have shown, you know, we would expect profit shifting to fall. That's it. Let me stop there and hand over to other speakers. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. And just to be very clear, Mike is not advocating for tax harmonization. Just to be you know, crystal clear about that. Um, there is a paper 
um, which uh, will be available uh, on the website, uh, which backs up what Mike has been talking about. Uh, and um, you would be very welcome to look at that. It'll also be on the ETPF website, etpf.org. Um, but with that, uh, thank you very much, Mike. Let me hand over to Cody. And Cody is going, I think, also has some slides and is going to um, uh, talk us through the, uh, the Tax Foundation slash Cody methodology uh, for estimating the effects of Pillar 2. Over to you, Cody. All right. So first, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Great. All right, so I'm going to take a bit of a US-centric approach. So Pillar 2, as uh, being spoken about by the OECD, would only apply to the largest US multi to the largest multinationals. But uh, the US version of this would generally apply to all US multinationals and uh, could look somewhat different depending on how it's actually structured. So what I'm just going to look at is how this uh, restructuring guilty to resemble Pillar 2 will impact US multinationals. So a quick overview of the model is structured as a set of about 3,500 controlled foreign corporations across 72 industries in 48 countries. And they're owned by a set of 40 representative multinational enterprises, all US headquartered in various industries. Now the data for this relies mostly on 2014 uh, tax information from the IRS on controlled foreign corporations and corporations claiming the foreign tax credit as well as BEA data on majority owned foreign affiliates of US multinationals and their US parents. So we have a CSC model, which calculates uh, foreign tax liabilities of these controlled foreign corporations, as well as how they contribute to their parents' US tax liability. We run through the parents' uh, actual tax calculations, and this produces two uh, variables of importance. The first is the federal corporate income tax liabilities of US multinationals, this is for revenue estimation, but also estimates the portion of these liabilities that are attributable to the activities of their controlled foreign corporations. So we can estimate the residual tax on those CFC profits. Now what we're actually modeling here, pillar two is more detailed and there are lots of things that are still unspecified. So I'm just going to narrow down to a handful of provisions. First, instead of using the guilty band, uh, we're going to use a flat 15% rate removing the 20% foreign tax credit haircut. We're also going to switch to country by country calculations, but structured as a top up tax. I think it's important to note that a top up tax is not the same as the traditional US approach to taxing foreign profits. Namely what we generally do is we include foreign part of foreign profits in the US tax base and provide a foreign tax credit. Because of complications like indirect expense allocation, these are not identical and the credit approach is generally somewhat more onerous than a top of tax approach. And you can still end up uh, with guilty liability even if your tax rate were to be above 15%. We're also going to use the new OECD carve outs updated as of last week. Uh, so 8% of tangible assets and 10% of payroll for 2023, the year when this is implemented and decreasing over a period of 10 years to eventually hit 5% starting in 2033. So by provision, the switching to the flat 15% guilty rate raises about $54 billion over a decade. Most of this comes just from the first three years of this as the guilty rate is already set to increase in 2026. Now switching to a country by country top up tax raises a lot less revenue than you would expect, only 14 billion over a decade. Now this is because, so country by country eliminates cross crediting and guilty, but this switch to a top up tax eliminates the complications and the interaction from expense allocation. Now, surprisingly, it turns out that the new substance carve outs relative to the current version are revenue neutral over the budget window. So they lose revenue initially when they're more generous and they raise revenue later on once uh, the phase downs of those carve outs begin. On net, this raises about $67.4 billion over a decade. Now, it's important to note that this depends on how this tax is actually structured. So the results that I just showed are for a top-up tax in line with what the OECD has imagined. But what if the US uses its uh, typical approach of inclusion with a credit? Uh, in this case, if we allow carry forward, it raises 70.5 billion over a decade. This is only a little bit more than what's being written uh, than the top-up approach. But if we don't allow carry forwards, as is the case on this current version of Guilty, this raises almost $112 billion. 
So depending on how it's actually implemented, the US version of Pillar 2 could potentially be much uh, more onerous than the version that would be implemented by other countries. And just for comparison, we can also look at the July version, and this would raise about $70 billion, a little more than the current ver version from October. And that's just because uh, the substance carve-outs have become more generous. Now, given that we're raising tax rates on uh, US multinationals, specifically on the foreign profits, this generally raises these effective tax rates. Now, unlike Michael Devereaux's approach, these are not forward-looking, these are the finance or financial measures. So these include both foreign profits and residually, I'm sorry, foreign taxes on CFC profits and residual US taxes from guilty and from subpart F rules. So uh, under current, uh, if we just look at all CFC profits, uh, switching to pillar two raises the effective tax rate from 16.8 to 17.2%. But this is not necessarily the right way to measure it. So there are a bunch of issues that arise in actually calculating these. One of these issues is that CFC profits are not 100% owned by US multinationals. And so these calculations should really be prorated. If we make that adjustment, then switching to implementing pillar two raises this effective tax rate from 19.3 to 19.8 percent. There's another issue that comes up as identified in some work by one of our discussants, Jennifer Bluen. There's double counting in the IRS measures of CSC profits that accounts related party dividends, uh, which really aren't new profits. And so, if we exclude those related party dividends, then implementing a pillar two would raise the effective tax rate from 23.8 to 24.2 but regardless of these measurement issues, the net change in the effective tax rate is just under half a percentage point. Now, of course, uh, those results are for across all industries in general, but the effects vary quite a bit across industries. So the ones facing the largest ETR effective tax rate increases are non-metallic mineral product manufacturing and transportation and warehousing, followed by computer and electronic product manufacturing. Now, only one of these is considered a high-tech industry. So why are the other, those other two uh, facing higher tax hikes? Well, it turns out that in the data, these two industries face relatively high variance in the effective foreign tax rates that they face. And consequently, under current law, uh, cross-crediting is there particularly valuable for these industries. So if we eliminate cross-crediting by switching to country-by-country -country calculations, these industries are very heavily impacted by it. On the uh, flip side, some industries get tax cuts from this. And that comes from switching to a top-up tax instead of the credit approach, so getting rid of expense allocation interactions, and from uh, pay the substance carve-out for payroll. So machinery manufacturing, motion picture and sound recording, and fabricated metal uh, product manufacturing all get net tax cuts. But looking more specifically at tech industries, I already mentioned computer and electronic product manufacturing gets a tax hike. We also see moderate tax hikes for pharmaceutical manufacturing and for electrical equipment, appliance, and component manufacturing, which includes semiconductors. And information services, other than recording and publishing, so mostly data services, uh, has no tax hike on that, surprisingly. So given that we're raising the effective tax rates on foreign profits in general, it's not surprising that this would decrease profit shifting. So this just looks at a few different uh, profit shifting responses. So what we're showing here is the 10 year revenue change from the proposal under different assumptions. If we use no profit shifting response, uh, implementing pillar two would raise $62 billion over a decade. If we use the consensus 0.8 semi-elasticity, it raises $67.4 billion. If we use the larger responsiveness estimated by Dowd, Landfill and Moore, so lower responsiveness for non-tax havens, much higher responsiveness for profits and tax havens, it raises $75 billion over a decade. So we see that uh, the pillar two would reduce profit shifting on net. However, this effect is fairly small. So changes of 5.4 and $13 billion are uh, fairly trivial over the course of a decade. So just to recap, pillar two would moderately raise the taxes on the foreign profits of US multinationals. Most of this revenue comes from the higher statutory rates, uh, but it's important to note that the, the actual $67 billion is much smaller than the proposals that have been considered either by the Biden administration or by the House Ways and Means Committee. 
And by smaller, I mean by an order of magnitude, so 10 to 15 times, those would be about 10 to 15 times larger. Now, this raises the effective tax rates on CFC profits by about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 percentage points, but the effect definitely varies by industry. And it's not clear, at least to me, that the US version of this would actually target uh, the high-tech sector very effectively. And so it does reduce profit shifting by US multinationals. That seems like a presumably a good thing, uh, but the effect is not particularly large. So I will right, so, um, discuss you... that. Did you have a question? No, no, it, it, it will. I was just going to, to do that. So thank you very much, uh, Cody, for um, uh, for doing that. One one conclusion one could draw from this, I guess, is that um, whatever is being proposed uh, to be done to guilty uh, might end up um, hitting U.S. corporations considerably harder than uh, whatever Pillar 2 may do to, uh, uh, to non-U.S. corporations. Um, but that wouldn't be a conclusion for me to draw. Um, so now we have two uh, great discussants. Um, I'm going to start with Lily, but I would love for Jennifer and uh, Lily to have a conversation, uh, if we can do that, to, to make this interactive. Um, Lily is going to, to comment on uh, what she's heard, but she's uh, also asked for permission, gladly granted, um, to range well beyond that uh, in, in Pillar 2. Um, and then Jennifer obviously has exactly the same privileges. Um, so Lily, let's start with you and then, um, uh, and then bring in Jennifer. Great, thank you so much for having me. So I wanted to start off by making just two big points about Pillar 2, and then I wanted to make a few comments on Mike and Cody's papers and then hand it over to Jennifer and hopefully we can all have a conversation about this. So the first big point I wanted to make about Pillar 2 is that this conference is asking whether the world economy is ready for a new global tax system. But I think for Pillar 2, the first question is, how much of a new global tax system will we really have? And that's because pillar two is not required. So the 136 countries did not agree to adopt a minimum tax themselves, despite what the reporting might suggest. So instead we have a so-called common approach. So that according to the OECD means three things. So first there's no need for any country to adopt a minimum tax. Second, if they do adopt a minimum tax, it must be consistent, according to the OECD, with the outcomes provided under Pillar 2. So that's fairly vague phrasing. What does it mean to be consistent with the outcomes provided under Pillar 2 as opposed to having to incorporate the model rules into domestic legislation? And the third thing that's worth noting about a common approach is that countries must accept the application of the minimum tax by others. So I think the first part of this question that's really important is who's actually going to adopt this? And this is important for minimum taxes generally. And I think it's important for talking about the conclusions reached by Cody and Mike. So do we just have to assume that everyone adopts this? Is it enough for only the US to change guilty to a minimum tax? Are there game theory issues here? So what happens if only a few countries do this? Does it matter which countries do this? And do low tax countries respond by raising rates if only some countries do this or if certain countries do this? Or do low tax countries put more investment in trying to attract assets and employees instead of changing rates? All of these decisions what do they do to companies' location decisions? And I think that the common approach raises a second question, which is what happens if countries adopt different versions? So how different can these versions be and still be seen as consistent with the pillar two outcomes? We don't know the answer to that question. That's going to be up to the inclusive framework to tell us probably post 2023, once they start looking at countries' different rules. But if these versions can be different, will these differences matter to companies as they make location decisions or possibly even as they decide where to headquarter, right? Will it matter what version of a minimum tax exists in your company's jurisdiction? So the first big point is just who's going to adopt this? What is it going to look like when they adopt it? The second big point that Cody addresses in his work is how does the substance-based carve out change this minimum tax, right? So this is the 8% of tangible assets, the 10% of payroll phasing down. Do companies respond to this by increasing employees or tangible assets abroad? 
And how does that change the analysis? Does that actually, what does it mean for location decisions if some of the location decision is now no longer purely tax motivated? And I think bigger picture outside of Cody and Mike's papers, what does this mean for what this really is? Is this really a minimum tax? Or is this an incentive to invest or employ in certain countries, at least in the short term? And as I think Will hinted, is this favoring certain low tax jurisdictions over others, right? Who is this? What is this actually doing to include this carve out? So those are my two big points. And then I'm just going to throw some questions to Mike and Cody. I really enjoyed both of the, um, the papers and the, and the presentations. So what does it mean for Pillar 2 to be introduced and work as intended? I think that was the phrasing you used, Mike. Um, does it mean that we kind of assume this is in 10 years, we don't have the carve out, this is everybody adopts it, or can we just say, this is looking at kind of a closed country. It's not closed because of what we're talking about, right? But this is looking at a country that adopts it and we're sort of assuming, we're making assumptions about what happens when other countries um, adopt this. How do the results change if only some countries adopt this? Does it matter if different countries could adopt different versions, right? So if there's some flexibility built into this common approach, what does that mean for companies' decisions? And what does that mean for companies' ta effective tax rates? And in terms of the substance-based carve-out, guilty doesn't have payroll. How does the inclusion of payroll matter? So Cody, I know you, you talked about this a little bit. Mike, I noticed that you consider four different assets. None of those are tied to payroll. Is there any value to thinking about sort of employment or number of employees in this? So those are some things just to spark discussion and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you so much for including me in this. So, Great, thanks very much, Lily. So let's hand over to, uh, to Jennifer and um, Mike and uh, Cody will come back to, uh, uh, to Lily's questions and presumably to Jennifer's questions uh, once Jennifer has spoken. So over to you, Jennifer. So I, I think my, my sense of both, piece, both papers is that what ultimately is gonna happen if we roll out what I am assuming is a common um, global minimum tax is it depends. And it depends on a whole bunch of things. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, we're going to collect some taxes, right? Um, what we'll see is some changes to investment decisions, but nothing massive, right? Nothing really, really large. And what's surprising, I think, from both works is that both of you conclude profit shifting isn't going away. And wasn't that the whole point of this? And, and I come back to, you know, when we think of the political landscape as everybody signs off and it's shake tens and send, saying kumbaya together and saying this is really going to change the the landscape and, I, and i'm just not sure it is um i'm gonna touch them briefly i i can't help but think of the cfc regimes right when all of these were rolled out what they were going to do is presumably put home country taxes on this bad passive income and that would stop profit shifting, even though we're aggregating over multiple countries, but firms ultimately said, hey, I'd rather pay a higher tax rate on a bigger base, or excuse me, on a, um, uh, on a bigger number, right? And if I leave those profits or those assets abroad, fine, tax me currently, that's more than what I would have if I had brought it, the, the assets home to the United States or the profits. And so I guess I, I, I conclude that I'm not terribly surprised about the findings. What's interesting to me, though, is the fact that this country by country doesn't matter for the tech industry in the way that I really would have thought, right? The people that were actually being targeted. And so I believe Lily was saying, well, you know, what happens if we have different countries roll this out in different ways? Um, it, that is what's going to happen. Um, the key, I think, to this proposal is how we define an effective tax rate. What is an ETR? I'm assuming I was invited because I'm the low you know, lonely uh, uh, accountants here on the panel, but that is a non-trivial computation. Um, I think Cody alluded to some of the work that I've been doing about how do I define, what do we look at when we estimate what profit shifting is because what measures are we using? The full intent here is to be using accounting numbers. And we've seen, I, isn't that what we did for country by country reporting too, right? And the goal was we should be able to add all these numbers up and that would be equal to what we see on consolidated financial statements for companies and you don't and you won't. Um, and so I, my understanding is from the blueprint, there's been a lot of thought about, well, gosh, how do we define income? 
the base, how do we define tax as the numerator? But at the end of the day, there's a lot of open questions. The biggest open question, at least in my mind, is how we deal with what I will call tax accounting differences. This is the fact that we have investment incentives, innovation decision uh, incentives, tax holidays that are, are brought or established in order to bring in investment or induce behavior. And how are we going to tweak this ETR calculation given that this is every country does something differently? Um, so I think where I'm interested to see how your analysis would work is if you incorporated say deferred tax expense in your computation of what an ETR is. Because the reading of the current blueprint seems to suggest that they recognize in particular stock options and depreciation are problematic, but so too are bad debt accounting and uh, you know, just accruals for revenues are, are very different, at least in the United States for book and tax. And so I'm thinking it would be interesting to just, let's assume that your deferred tax expense is part of the numerator in this ETR, and then maybe we would be better served trying to explain what shouldn't be in that ETR relative than what we should carve out. But as soon as you have heterogeneity um, in, a, in, in tax accounting, as well as financial reporting, your ETR by definition varies across every jurisdiction, and therefore you do have 136 arguably different global minimum tax computa computations. So, at the end of the day, to me, it's still a cost benefit trade off, given that we're not getting all that much profit shifting um, in light of, I think, some pretty heavy duty uh, role for accountants coming up in order to make this thing viable. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. Yes, the, the question, as we've discussed before, the question of um, the tax base is a, a fairly crucial one uh, and one which uh, isn't yet clear. Uh, on tax competition, yes, one is um, always reminded of, of St. Augustine, give me chastity and continence, but not yet, Lord. Um, and uh, the carve outs do appear to be heading in that direction. It's no particular surprise. Um, anyway, um, so Mike and Cody, um, uh, Lily in particular, but Jennifer also asked a couple of questions. Do you want to come back on that for a minute or two? And then we can, um, uh, in the uh, 13 minutes remaining to us, we can uh, uh, have a conversation about uh, any aspect of Pillar 2 that we would like to. Mike, maybe you go first. Okay, okay thanks. And uh, thanks, Lily and Jennifer, for those comments, all, all great comments. Um, so I uh, Lily asked, what do I mean when I say it was, you know, it was, you know, let's assume that it's introduced as intended and, you know, good question. I, I was trying to kind of obviously skate over all the problems that you've just been raising. And um, so I, you know, in the context of the model, I am assuming that everybody introduces it perfectly and, you know, everybody does exactly the same thing, you know, that's, but, you know, I'm, that's what economics does. We can assume away some of these things and then, you know, people can tell us we haven't got it right. Um, I, I mean, the I think a big, big issue as you raise is what if only some countries adopt it? Um, I think from the perspective of what I was trying to do, that's um, it's not it's that's an interesting question, you know, given the structure of pillar two in that, you know, who, who's going to there's a question of who's going to collect this revenue or whether it's ever going to be collected. You know, if if you're a multinational company and you can manage to kind of stay out of pillar two altogether by only being in countries which don't adopt it then um, you're in, that's a different world from the one that I've modeled. Um, and if you're a multinational and you're, you're in a, your parent company is in a country which doesn't adopt it, but actually some other subsidiaries are in countries which adopt it, then the, the under tax payment rule can kick in and actually you'll be taxed anyway. And in that context, you know, what matters for the companies is, you know, they're gonna have to pay some tax rather than who are they gonna pay the tax to. Um, so, I th you know, that's, I think those are all kind of very important questions when we think about you know, applying in practice. I, I mean, I think the, the carve out is really interesting. We kind of basically have modeled that, you know, mo mostly on the grounds that, you know, we're kind of assuming that there's this place where you're not really doing anything and you don't have any capital or labor, so there would be no carve out. But certainly when you kind of come back and, and say, okay, well, what happens if the threshold is 15 and, and the country only has a tax rate of 11, say, um, then that certainly comes in there and we haven't actually put that into the paper yet. I think that's a, that's a good point. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I, while I'm just speaking and I have the thought, I mean, I think, you know, the problems of effective tax rate as measured by accounting uh, issues, I mean, Jennifer knows far more about the actual measurement of this um, 
but conceptually it seems to me there's a kind of big question as to why people think the effective tax rate as in terms of kind of tax divided by accounting profit is any better than the statutory rate you know the statutory rate would be tax divided by taxable profit that is the statutory rate so why do we think accounting measure is a better measure of what we're interested in than uh taxable profit and i don't have an answer to that i don't know what the answer is and it's not clear to me that it's any better than using the statutory rate especially for you know some of the reasons which jennifer has given um, and you know i there are lots of reasons why we might want tax or profits to be different from accounting profits, you know, R&D tax credits or because we only want to tax economic rents or whatever. Um, all of those are going to create problems there. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Cody. Yeah, so uh, regarding Lillian's comments, uh, there are two particular pieces that I can speak to. So first, uh, you mentioned uh, the substance carve-outs and how the switch to payroll matters. So first I can tell you 8% of tangible assets for most industries is much more valuable than 10% of payroll. There are exceptions like the motion picture and sound recording industry, which is one of those that gets a tax cut. But I think that payroll exemption is more valuable for uh, multinationals from other countries, which may have more labor intensive production technology. Uh, the other piece is that uh, game theory idea. So what? how should other countries respond to this? So what if Ireland were to raise its effective tax, uh, the effective tax rates that multinationals pay to get up to at least 15%? Well, what happens there is uh, the Irish tax liabilities of US multinationals increase, but they get a higher foreign tax credit in the US. And as a consequence of that, part of the Irish tax hike gets absorbed by, the, uh, by a reduction in the US tax base. And that's even without any profit shifting response. And so there is an issue where if, once you adjust for uh, how foreign countries might respond to these uh, tax or to the incentives from pillar two, uh, the US could end up losing a significant amount of tax revenue from this. Now it's difficult to actually figure out how large this would be because I don't know how big their response is and it's hard to tell without knowing the actual finer details of the pillar two provisions. Thanks very much, Cody. I mean, it, it's interesting on the, um, on the payroll exemption because that has been talked up by some countries uh, as actually being some type of a substitute for uh, a more straightforward R&D uh, carve out uh, on the basis that, you know, the innovative folks in white coats they get paid a whole lot more than the, you know, sort of the metal beaters uh, on the factory floor. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we, that we also saw the um, Hungarian finance minister, I think, talked about this last week. And, uh, or maybe it was Switzerland, I'm getting confused now, there are so many of these darn things floating around. Um, actually, it was Switzerland, suggested that actually there should be a, a double carve out, um, you know, sort of 100% increase uh, for payroll related to R&D. So you can see uh, where where people are headed on that. Um, we, as I said right at the beginning, we know that um, that Ireland made an oblique reference to uh, R and D incentives uh, continuing to operate. Uh, how we don't know, um, but it is you know once again clear that um, I'm not going to repeat Saint Augustine again, but um, you you get the picture um, that countries will be looking to their self interest as they construct this. And you know to the point that that Mike made and that that Lily answered certainly. Um, you know, as, as, a, as a lawyer, um, sort of lawyer, um, uh, you know, where I am getting my drafting pen out, um, implement and administer the rules in a way that is consistent with the outcomes provided for under pillar two. Um, I could, uh, I could work with that. Let's put it like that. Um, so, um, uh, uh, Jennifer and Lily, uh, any uh, comments to, to come back on what, uh, what Cody and Mike said, or indeed anything else that, that, that it might be useful to, to raise? Jennifer, by all means, um, expound still further on the deferred tax accounting should you wish to. <laughs> I'm sure you will all be delighted to learn more about that. But no, this this new substance issue, right? I mean, tangible, so I mean, this is something when we think about payroll, what do they mean payroll? Do they include the social welfare taxes? Do they include wealth, you know, retirement benefits, right? Because this could again vary 
widely across jurisdiction. And I don't know, Cody, how you assumed payroll, you know, provisions in, in your existing work. And then the tangible asset problem, OECD talked a whole lot about something called push down accounting, which I probably am the only person here that pays a lot of attention to that. But it's like they want to say, but don't pay attention to the push down accounting. But yet we want you to use financial reporting, which is just a way if you buy assets, you write them up to fair market value. So a very acquisitive corp company will have a very different asset base that now not only affects, you know, when you think about ETR, it's, it's, it doesn't affect ETR, but it's going to very much affect the substance rule now. And so uh, it becomes an important point to, to consider, at least if you're an inquisitive, um, in an inquisitive industry and you have varying accounting rules because IFRS does not allow for this marking up to fair market value where GAAP does. So it's just the substance just add this other layer of complexity, but I'm curious about how we define payroll. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's an excellent point. So there, or there are really two points in there. So uh, for <clears throat> payroll, I have uh, BEA data on labor compensation uh, for majority on foreign affiliates in different industries and countries. So I rely on that. Uh, the, but there is this issue that you've identified of ex actually what tax, ac what accounting measure you use. So they've formally put it, I believe, as financial accounting with adjustments for timing differences and for tax policy goals, which is incredibly nebulous and is worthless to me. But uh, so what I do is I use the US tax accounting approach just because I've already built the infrastructure for that. And it's likely that that's, personally, I think that's what the US would probably continue to use. But I've been working on a, building out the real activity side of the model. And so potentially uh, we could look at how that would change if we use financial accounting instead. I'll just follow up to, to Cody and Mike's responses. I actually think one of the big takeaways from this discussion is that this is a huge step, right? If we had asked you know, five or six years ago, would countries agree to even the concept of a minimum tax? I think most of us here would have said that seemed very unlikely, but it's also maybe not as huge a step as, is being, as it's being presented as when you start to talk about all of the carve outs, sort of the ways that, you know, Cody's point about foreign tax credits possibly reducing revenue. Um, and I think that's just something, you know, important to highlight that I think, at least in the US, when you see this being discussed in the popular press, apparently 136 countries just decided to change their corporate income tax rate to 15%, right? We all know that that didn't happen, but it's worth, you know, I think it's important that the, the question of what is consistent with the outcomes, you know, as I say all the time, I am a tax law professor. Um, Congress and the OECD are constantly engaged in job creation for my students, right? Because there are always new questions about what is it to be consistent with um, the OECD's outcomes and how do you sort of work within that? And so, you know, it's a giant step forward, but there are a lot of ways that it's maybe not the kind of final step that it's being presented as. Can can I just come back on the game More theory? Well, if that's possible. I mean, just, Mike. No, no, go on, Mike. No, no. Um, well, just because I think the substance based carve out is very important here is to kind of thinking, you know, what is it that Pillar 2 is trying to do? Or, you know, probably, you know, lots of people have different things in mind that they were trying to have it have it to do. Um, but, you know, the idea that this is, a, you know, this is putting a floor under tax competition, for example doesn't really make much sense if the substance-based carve-out is, is a real thing and, it, and, and it's quite significant. You know, that turns it very much into a CFC rule, which is attacking, you know, profit shifting rather than being a, an instrument to try and kind of put for under tax competition. And it seems to me you can't, you probably not, you can't have both. You have to decide which, which one it is that you're trying to go for. And it seems very much we're going into the kind of anti-profit shifting CFC direction rather than the let's try and get rid of uh, tax competition direction. I'll get rid of certain types of tax competition. So, yeah, I mean, as Kevin, yeah. as Kevin Brady said, this can, this can go in one of two directions, convergence or divergence you, um, between the US and elsewhere. You, you, you make your choice. Okay, with that, uh, I'm gonna bring this to a close. I would really like to thank uh, Mike and Cody and Lily and uh, Jennifer for, uh, for joining us for what has been a great panel. Um, there's gonna be a five minute break and then Pam Olson will be back uh, to wrap this up with yet another exciting panel. This has been a great conference. So thank you all very much for joining me. 
and um, next year in person, perhaps. Anyway, thanks, everyone.
Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, Pam. Hello, Akalash. I uh, don't see uh, Anthony on. Is he? Uh, is he? I think on? he's around there somewhere. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's go ahead and get started with the uh, introductions. Um, first, uh, I'm I'm Pam Olson, and I'm pleased to be able to moderate two panels in succession. We're going to be looking at the perspective of practical issues associated with the topics we've just been discussing, uh, involving both the um, implementation as well as the administrative challenges associated with Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Um, so for the first panel, I'm delighted to be joined by Akalish Ranjan. Uh, Akalish is with uh, PwC in India, uh, but importantly, he is a former member of the Indian Central Board of Direct Taxes uh, and spent uh, 37 years with the Indian Revenue Authority. Uh, also joining us is Anth Anthony Munanda, Anthony is a technical expert in international taxation with the African Tax Administration Forum, which has obviously played a very big role in uh, the conversations that have gone on regarding Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. Um, and uh, uh, thank you both for joining me. I think uh, perhaps we'll start with you, Akalesh, if you would um, please uh, take us through what you see with respect to Pillar one and some of the issues there, and then we'll turn to Anthony for his comments. But I think um, <clears throat> since we are talking here of the implementation, uh, one of the one of the basic asks of developing countries has always been that we would like to have a simple solution, and that's been reiterated uh, time and again uh, that uh, that more many developing countries may not have the capacity to. Uh, to implement more complex systems. Uh, somehow, uh, even the solutions that were offered on behalf of the, of the developing countries by the G24, for example, uh, were simple solutions or simpler than what is being out, uh, brought out now, but somehow they didn't get any traction. I heard, um, I heard um, uh, panelists here speaking on this webinar earlier, uh, Ms. Lorraine, uh, uh, who, who said that maybe there were better solutions or better ways of taxing uh, digital uh, companies on digital economy. I entirely agree and I think developing countries would also agree there are many other ways of, of, of uh, doing the same thing with much less complexity. Be that as it may, it, this is what we have and um, there is complexity not just in understanding what the solution is, how the safe harbors will work, how the elimination of double taxation will work, those are things that are still not clear. Uh, the multilateral conventions that will have to be entered into, all right, somebody will draft them, that's fine. Um, but then somebody will have to implement them. Somebody will have in the administration, somebody will have to monitor what's happening in, in around the world. Is the revenue being sourced properly? Is the profit being allocated properly? And then uh, 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 and to see that uh, the interests of the country are maintained. I think that there's a whole amount of complexity uh, and there's resources that are required. Uh, some part of the resources will have to be kept aside and dedicated for this whole purpose, um, uh, which, which, will, which will come in uh, come into play. Uh, and then, when if you look at what is it worth, really, uh, is our developing countries really getting a fair share? What they wanted was a fair and equitable share. Um, well, uh, it, it's not clear as yet what. What exactly are they going to get? Is there going to be a revenue gain? Is that gain going to be commensurate or proportionate with the amount of efforts that they put in? Um, I think that position is still unclear. I, I, in my, my understanding, the basic sort of mood in developing countries right now is that of, a, of, a, uh, of an acceptance of, of, of sort of a acceptance saying that, all right, we will accept the solution uh, without being very enthusiastic about it. And then um, uh, let's coming to the there are there are there are dispute resolution mechanisms out here, which uh, uh, countries have opted and adopted and willingly adopted mandatory and binding dispute resolution mechanisms. Um, what does it entail? I think I don't think countries have really understood that uh, what, what's happening. Who will raise those disputes? Where will those disputes be raised? Who are the people who will decide on this? Who will decide whether this is an amount which is related to amount A or not? Uh, these are all issues which, which are going to be extremely complex and uh, 
um, and hence uh, uh, implementation of these measures is going to be a very tough ask for most developing countries and even countries like the India who claim to have a, a fairly sophisticated tax system. Um, I think um, um, I think that, that's that's what uh, something is much more major concern to to countries like India at the moment. Great, thank you, Akhilesh. And now, Anthony, if we can bring you in for some comments on Pillar One. Uh, thank you very much, Paul uh, <clears throat> uh, Palm, uh, for invitation, uh, inviting Ataf. Um, I represent uh, the Executive Secretary, uh, Mr. Logan Watts, who could not manage to join this meeting. Um, I think coming from those comments by Rajab has uh, already laid a basis for uh, African countries and indeed other developing countries. Uh, first and foremost, to say that ATAF itself and its membership has been heavily and intensively involved in this uh, long, complex and difficult negotiations at the inclusive framework. Uh, so that work obviously has led to an agreement, uh, which we all know about it from last week. Uh, but in our view, we look at that as a global negotiation. And in any negotiation process, you don't get what you want. And so it's African countries, whereas we looked for these proposals uh, back um, when there was a blueprint and identified the complexity of the proposals as uh, Rajan identified and made a proposal uh, some of our recommendations have not been taken on board. Okay, and that, that, that's a reality because it's a, a global negotiation. Uh, but suddenly we see that there is a, a step uh, in, uh, in the right direction, but we view it as a first step, the beginning, so to speak, because it does not take Africa where it's supposed to be in terms of building effective uh, and efficient regimes to tax multinational enterprises. Uh, so we still find, we still view that there will be need to carry out further work uh, in, in the coming days to address more fundamental issues, at least from African perspective. And the main issues are trying to address the issue of allocation of taxing rights between source and resident states. And of course, coming up with more effective rules that uh, are able to stop illicit financial flows uh, using, of course, uh, um, Based eroding payments or other mechanism of artificially shifting profits. Uh, so th those are uh, initial remarks. But coming specifically to pillar one uh, itself, um, as a starting point, uh, we wish to note that many of the things it have proposed in its alternative proposal to pillar one, they are already reflected uh, in the new rules. Uh, so at least we, we are happy uh, to that extent. And just to give an example of those, we proposed for a broader scope of the rules, not just to target ADS or consumer facing businesses. And now we have that broader scope. Uh, we propose not to have, uh, um, have plus factors in the design of Nexus rules. We have that. We propose to have uh, uh, a much better Nexus rule, which will uh, allow or ensure most of the uh, small uh, economies are not excluded out of amount, amount A, and therefore that lower threshold of 1 million and even much lower, uh, 250,000 uh, euros for smaller GDP economies is, is much welcome. And more fundamentally, uh, an elective binding dispute resolution mechanism uh, for, for many of developing economy jurisdictions. So th those are those are positive uh, movements in our view, uh, which have been reflected in the agreement. So what are our concerns? I think our primary concern is that the new agreement uh, still does not have significant profits being allocated to market jurisdictions. As we've indicated under this comprehensive framework, the, allocate, the allocable profits uh, should be uh, much higher than what we got in the agreement, which is 25. Uh, in our written comments, and in many occasions, we have indicated that uh, the allocable profits should be at least 35% of the residue profits of MNUs in scope. So we are disappointed that did not happen. However, is there anything of benefit for country? Is there any revenue contribution? We certainly see that um, the targeted MNUs that are going to be in scope uh, there will be some profits being paid in market jurisdiction 
including in Africa, in situations that would not have been the case because those MNEs don't have physical presence. Or those MNEs have maybe some users, and those users will be considered in the renew rules to determine nexus. So there is some bit of benefit, notwithstanding that there is limited profits being allocated. So in relation to implementation issues, I think Rajan has already indicated a broad range of obvious things which uh, both tax administration and businesses themselves, uh, they would need to address in implementing these rules. And these are around uh, revenue sourcing rules, which are fairly complex, new ways of uh, determining those rules, um, uh, where, of course, revenues have been sourced. Uh, elimination of double taxation and disputes uh, in relation to amount A itself. I mean, disputes for amount A itself and also other disputes such as P adjustments or TP adjustment for the subsidiaries of those companies. Uh, but the way we see it from Africa perspective, uh, most of those administrative challenges may not affect uh, these kind of jurisdictions because the MNEs that are going to be in scope will be large and most profitable. They are not quartered in these kind of jurisdictions. Uh, those are, that is a relief from a tax administrative uh, perspective. However, these markets, uh, these countries are also possibly are going to be market jurisdiction. Therefore, they will, they will need to comply with the multilateral convention that I talked about. And therefore, they need to build resource uh, to put resource to capacity those countries to negotiate, sign, and ratify those multilateral conventions to be able to get benefits uh, from, from this new instrument. And then the last point I would like to make here is that uh, the elective binding dispute resolution mechanism at least benefits a number of uh, developing countries, not just Africa, uh, because uh, at least jurisdictions that are going to qualify for that elective mechanism, at least they will not go through a uh, cumbersome, costly process, uh, which takes away their resources, uh, which are quite limited to do normal audits or to deal with other tax administration in doing that uh, dispute resolution mechanism. In situations where there is no much of tax anyway at stake because those kind of jurisdiction don't have many of uh, map cases. Um, there are obviously a number of issues to be designed around that elective dispute resolution. Uh, so we are keenly of course be following to see the design that remains beneficial. Again, it's not complex. And of course, uh, many of countries have benefits out of that process. Uh, so those will be my remarks for now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Akulesh, can we come back to you on pillar two? If we have a couple of minutes at the end, I've got a couple of questions I want to follow up with both of you on. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, uh, well, the, the solution on pillar two, of course, that is, it has an advantage over the pillar one in the sense that there is, it's a principle-based solution. There is one, one, one uh, tries very hard to find a principle in the pillar one solution, but doesn't really get anywhere. But uh, so here there is a principle which is which is acceptable, which is appreciable. And I think uh, developing countries in general have welcomed uh, the agreement on pillar two. The only problem is that it doesn't benefit any developing country. It, 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 uh, uh, there is hardly any revenue gain which uh, developing countries would uh, would like to uh, uh, would, 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 would can count on at the moment. Uh, and that's because, uh, of course, there are companies, for example, India has about 200 odd companies who, uh, which cross that threshold of 750 million euros. But then uh, uh, the structure of these companies is not such that any additional revenue, substantial additional revenue would come to India through the income inclusion rule. Uh, the under tax payment rule is something which could have could have yielded more revenue, uh, but that's become even more complex uh, in, in its understanding. In fact, this rate statement says that it will probably, the, the whole details will probably take some time uh, to come out. Uh, there was a high reliance on the subject to tax rule, um, which, which, which should take care of a lot of base erosion problems. Uh, but again, one is disappointed to see that there is no agreement as yet on the scope of the subject to tax rule. It's still the same old sentence of saying royalties and interest and some defined payments. Uh, it's common knowledge that, that most of the base erosion in develop, developing countries 
takes place through things like management fees uh, and various types of uh, shared costs. These are these are um, these are things which must be covered in that scope, and and it is amazing that why why it has not yet been thought of. So uh, so so this solution then is doesn't it doesn't really inspire or make or make the developing countries very enthusiastic. On the other hand, they will have to enact those laws. They will have to have complex legislation on the statutes um, to deal with things like the under tax payment rule and the subject to tax payment rule. Uh, they will have to have uh, uh, maybe uh, another multilateral convention. Uh, there will be a multilateral instrument for the STTR, of course. So it's going to be a maze of laws and 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 uh, and, and dozens of uh, instances of administrative practices, which all these countries have to follow. So it's going to be quite 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 burdensome to to do when, especially knowing that the revenue gain is not going to be substantial. And does it really solve the problem of base erosion? As I said. Um, the subject to tax rule was or is the one instrument which developing countries would have counted upon uh, to, to relieve uh, or to, to prevent base erosion. But until the scope of this rule is really fleshed out, um, well, it's just limiting it to things like royalty and interest doesn't really help at all. I mean, we already, we already have withholding taxes on that. We have rules on limitation of interest deductibility um, uh, it, it doesn't really help it to and doesn't get any more uh, better uh, to, to have these rules. So the scope is something that India is looking forward. Countries like India are, I'm sure, looking forward to a much broader scope of this rule, which can really prevent base erosion. And if that happens, then yes, probably the whole exercise will certainly be worth uh, going into. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Anthony, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first and foremost, I share most of the same sentiments by Rajesh on subject to tax. Uh, and of course, uh, the effectiveness of the globe rules, particularly in uh, developing countries. So I'll start on that point. Uh, I think based on our uh, consistent comments about uh, Pillar 2, uh, we've made it very clear we had concerns with the rule order. Uh, we of the view that under tax payment rule, uh, should have been a priority rule, uh, but uh, we got where we are, that the income inclusion rule is a priority rule. And of course, in very limited circumstances, then under tax payment rule apply. Uh, therefore, it means uh, most of the benefits in terms of revenue, at least in the short run, uh, will go to resident jurisdictions. Uh, uh, but uh, moving away from that point, uh, looking at the minimum effective rates, which has been agreed at 15%, uh, even with the current design of the rule, we see that the globe rules will not be effective to prevent base erosion in Africa. Particularly, why? Because the CIT rates of majority of African countries range between 25 to 35%. Uh, and therefore, there is still incentive to base a road through a couple of African countries. Uh, and therefore, uh, our proposal earlier was that the minimum effective rate should have been at least 20%. Uh, that at least would really create a significant disincentive uh, to that kind of a profit shifting move. Um, now, because we did not get under tax payment rule, or we got the subject to tax rule. And I will, uh, as I said earlier, we share the sentiments of India. It is uh, one rule which would help many developing countries fix gaps in their tax treaties, where of course uh, companies take advantage of those treaties to get significant deductions. Of course, for incomes which are not going to be taxed up to uh, reasonably in the recipient jurisdiction. So arguably uh, it's more protective uh, in many uh, developing countries, only if it is broad in scope. I think so there we have a consistent message. Uh, we're still watching on the design on what is this uh, other defined set of payments. Uh, our proposal is that, should, that at least should include things like management fees and technical fees, because we have cases here where some countries have lost in excess of $75 million. That's a real country we've looked at just because they made payments through a treaty partner and that income was not taxed. It enjoyed preferential tax rates in the recipient jurisdiction. The tax treaty itself exempted that income from any form of withholding tax. So it's a significant move 
in fact, all those kind of payments are brought in scope. Uh, uh, in terms of um, implementation challenges, I think uh, a whole range of things are going to happen, uh, but a more fundamental issue, at least in many of developing countries, is possible interaction between the globe rules and the tax incentive regimes. So many countries have got now to start thinking about how those will be reformed. And of course, a lot of resources will need to be uh, put aside to support jurisdiction to potentially reform those, those, those regimes. And of course, uh, there will be obviously a whole range of legal regimes, uh, a new domestic laws to implement uh, globe rules and potentially to sign uh, and ratify a new multilateral instrument uh, to swiftly benefit from SDTR if countries want to implement. So there are, of course, uh, challenges ahead from implementation. And, and those, I think, are some of the key issues. And the last one, I think, I would say, particularly for subject to tax being a transactional based uh, tax, uh, the rules are still developed on whether that subject to tax will be paid when the transaction takes place, or you need to have um, a, a, another alternative approach of looking at payments maybe at the end of the year, because maybe there are other considerations the MNE needs to take into place to find out whether the tax is, uh, whether the transaction qualifies for STTR and whether there is any additional tax. So th those are very important issues. Uh, in actual rollout of SDTR. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, both of you. Um, we are um, a minute over time, but I'd like to ask you both just one question, which is, um, Anthony, you described this as step one. Um, how long till we take step two? Uh, so, sorry, I, missed, uh, I described step one? Yes, you described this effort as step one. How long yes. is it until the international community okay. step two? Uh, from our perspective, uh, that step two should uh, immediately, it should be a continuing process uh, because already there are concerns on the table by many countries, including that those have joined the agreement and those concerns should be the starting point of uh, maybe new areas which perhaps have not been reflected so as ETAF will, will actively engage in that new framework, which I'm sure the inclusive framework uh, should be able to take it up immediately because of the range of concerns from many countries. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you both for uh, those comments. Really appreciate it. And um, we'll move on to the second part of our panel um, where we will bring in our two congressional uh, staffers who've joined us. Um, it's a great pleasure to have uh, with us uh, Beth Bell and Courtney Connell. Um, Beth is the uh, uh, counsel to the House Ways and Means Committee um, and uh, has been on the Hill for quite a while, but does bring private sector experience to the job. I'm glad to have you with us, Beth. And then Courtney Connell is counsel to the Senate Finance Committee, Republican staff. Um, and we're going to talk about the uh, implementation uh, here in the U.S. and the challenges that we might face in uh, implementing, as well as maybe in administration if we get to that. Um, but uh, because the House goes first on uh, revenue raising measures, we're going to start with Beth. And Beth, if you could take us through your thoughts on implementation of Pillar 1. Yeah, I'm happy to do that on Pillar 1 in, in particular. Um, I know this audience knows well, but in our current legislative efforts, a lot of the attention has been focused onto Pillar 2. Um, and so uh, that's not to, I, I mentioned that because it's not to say that the membership isn't also tracking Pillar 1. Um, it's just that, you know, you hear most about uh, Pillar 2 and global minimum taxes in our current legislative environment. On Pillar 1, like I say, you know, that we have members who are focused in interest on how uh, those provisions are going to get across the finish line, um, especially because, you know, we understand from the negotiations that Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 are linked. Uh, I know that the uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen has said that Pillar 1 may be on a you know, slower path, perhaps, but I think that there's a you know, there's an acknowledgement among members of Congress that this this effort is a 
a joint effort. And so, uh, you know, if you had uh, if 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 you had asked me um, in another context, I would I would likely say, um, just taking a look at something like Pillar One, that you know, hey, maybe we need we maybe we need some domestic law changes here. Maybe we need uh, a, a treaty um, to to go into place here, um, either a multilateral treaty or a bilateral treaty. Um, but bilateral treaty is between our, our various partners who sign on to this agreement. Uh, but, but, you know, I think that uh, we are awaiting our advice on, from our uh, Treasury colleagues on that. Um, the treaty process is something that, you know, Congress has some visibility into, but I know that in other contexts, like in uh, FATCA, for instance, intergovernmental agreements have prevailed. And so it, um, it is perhaps possible, even though, um, you know, institutionally, that has not typically been the case, um, that Congress is able, that um, the Treasury is able to move the ball forward um, with minimal congressional intervention. Um, that, you know, I, I'm curious to hear Courtney's thoughts because the treaty power is exclusively a Senate power. And even though I'm formally a creature of the Senate, I, I very um, humbly defer to my, my current Senate colleagues um, on, on their views. Um, you know, I think I've, I've, I've also said this before, but, you know, on the more um, bluntly political front on, on Pillar One implementation, you know, I think that as as the, the OECD process moves forward and as folks continue to engage on the details, um, I think three things remain in terms of what the members will be focused on uh, should you know, a Pillar One implementation agreement come to Congress. Um, the first and foremost is uh, the revenue impact. Um, you know, you could argue that Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 need to be viewed together. I think on the legislative tracks we're on, perhaps they will be viewed separately. Um, but I'd remind folks that if uh, we do, in fact, need a treaty to get Pillar 1 uh, completed in the U.S., that treaties don't score. Um, so that could have uh, interesting revenue implications uh, for how Congress views, um, views the revenue raised and lost by this exercise. Uh, but at any rate, um, as I think is pretty uh, intuitive to, to this crowd, at least, uh, members will be asking about the revenue impacts. I think they'll also be asking quite a bit about what the U.S. gets out of an agreement, um, about, you know, kind of uh, changing uh, the, the tax base and how we reach into other foreign countries' tax bases and how they reach into ours. Uh, uh, a lot, we hear a lot about enforcement mechanisms, uh, and that's something that I think that will be top of mind in terms of outside of revenue. Um, if the, you know, given that the U.S. has joined in this agreement, what's in it for the U.S.? Uh, and finally, you know, I think this is often not yeah, uh, talked about, but, uh, you know, in kind of the political wrangling, but we really would need, I think, and members would ask us kind of what's the principle behind this movement to a pillar one regime? What's the principle behind changing our tax base here? There could be a lot of good answers to that. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the Congress needs, you know, a, a good um, policy uh, reason to move forward with, with what it's doing. And I suspect that will develop as more of the details of pillar one. Uh, get developed, so, and so those are my those are my general thoughts on Pillar One. I know we want to get to you know more questions, and I certainly uh, look forward to hearing what Courtney has to say. All right, that's a good segue to Courtney. Thanks, Beth, um, and and thanks, Pam. I have to give the disclaimer that my comments are my own and and don't represent the views of Senator Crapo or or any other member of the Senate Finance Committee. Um, and I agree with a number of the comments that, that Beth provided as well. And I'll kind of try to hit on those as I go through on pillar one. But I think, you know, with the agreement on Friday, I, I was struck by, you know, the detailed implementation plan perhaps left out some of the detail that, that I was expecting to see. And there just seemed to remain a number of unanswered questions and a significant amount of work still to be done, particularly with respect to determining, you know, surrender jurisdictions, sourcing amount B, um, the mechanism for binding dispute resolution, which as Beth mentioned, is going to be a really important one for members, um, among other issues. Um, it did provide an update on timing, although um, another big issue for members, uh, timing for elimination of existing DSTs, um, still appears to be unclear. Uh, so given that 
you know, the elimination of DSTs is one of the primary objectives for entering into the negotiations. The, the lack of, of clarity on timing is, is concerning and um, it suggests DSTs may not be eliminated until, you know, potentially 2023. Um, I think you know my boss and other members have made clear that DST should be removed upon reaching a high-level agreement, uh, and that objective clearly wasn't achieved uh, yet. So, also concerning um, are the reports suggesting an EU digital levy, you know, will be or could be permissible under the agreement. Um, again, just given that we don't know whether or how those uh, or that levy could indirectly target U.S. companies. Uh, specifically on implementation, so my boss, Senator Crapo, as well as Senators Risch and Toomey, uh, sent a letter to Secretary Yellen last Friday highlighting the need uh, for a treaty to properly implement Pillar 1. So there have been some recent comments by Secretary Yellen, as well as um, a, a nominee for a senior Treasury position, indicating Treasury might be considering whether some sort of congressional executive agreement uh, could be used to implement Pillar 1. So I should absolutely provide the disclaimer that, that treaty issues are within foreign relations jurisdiction. Uh, but as the letter states, I think based on the information we have, which obviously there's still a lot of details that we're waiting to see, but given that we know, um, you know based on the, uh, the agreement as, as described, bilateral treaties uh, and provisions within our existing bilateral tax treaties will need to be modified. Uh, so given that um you know the, as the letter states the changes needed weigh heavily in favor of a multilateral treaty um or other you know formal uh, bilateral tax treaty changes as opposed to some form of legislative override or executive agreement um so that's that was kind of the key conclusion from that letter and obviously we're still waiting to get a lot of details um but I think there, there is concern among members that um, at least consideration is being given to, to whether Pillar 1, um, the administration could you know, try to implement Pillar 1 without going through the, the Senate treaty approval process. Uh, just in terms of the policy, I think, as Beth mentioned, there's still um, a lot of uncertainty as to how Pillar one will affect US companies and US revenue. So, you know, my boss has asked for substantive detail on the impact of the Pillar one agreement on US companies. So how much profit will be reallocated from the US and to which, you know, which countries. Um, but as we noted in Friday's letter, Treasury hasn't provided that information yet to our members. So that kind of lack of meaningful engagement and providing substantive information on the effect of the agreement um, you know, that sets a precedent in terms of how, um, you know, how much tax certainty there, there may be as a result of this agreement or, or the durability of the agreement. I think in terms of political issues, um, you know, my boss has noted that with the change in administration, there was also a pretty significant shift in, in Treasury's priorities in the negotiations. So previously, um, and on a very bipartisan basis, there was a focus on the elimination of DSTs and ensuring that we reach an agreement that's fair to the U.S. business community. Um, and I think, you know, the U.S. was supportive of Pillar 2, of course, but it wasn't the focus, given that we were and are the only country with a global minimum tax. But just given this push on Pillar 2 uh, this year, um, you know, it's consistent with the administration's domestic tax agenda. You know, we've expressed concerns that the shift in priorities to secure a higher Pillar 2 rate could have come at the cost of compromises on Pillar 1. Um, and I think from that perspective, it also maybe makes the path to implementation on Pillar 1 a bit less certain. Um, and I also think, you know, best point regarding, um, you know, viewing Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 separately, at least from a revenue standpoint, is a very fair one, just given the political process of, of Pillar 2 moving through potentially through reconciliation um, and kind of the separate track, at least from a, an implementation standpoint, um, I, it does seem like members may view uh, the revenue effect uh, separately. And so that's why it's also equally important that, um, that we understand exactly how Pillar 1 is going to affect U.S. companies and U.S. revenue. Um, and just given uh, decreasing amount of time that we're going to have here, maybe we should shift over to Pillar 2 and give Beth another opportunity to talk. 
Yes, thank you. Beth, if you could take us through, I think we've got about five minutes left. If you could take us through that very quickly, that would be terrific. Yes, and I should associate myself first with the same disclaimer as Courtney replacing my boss's name with her boss's name. I, I rarely forget to do that, but she did it so well that I'll just um, do it by association. Um, so, you know, on pillar two, um, I think that, uh, as I said at the top, uh, the, um, the Congress is engaged in that legislative debate right now in terms of modifying our guilty rules to more closely align with uh, what was proposed at the OECD. There are a couple of significant changes in um, the House Ways and Means marked up provisions uh, that uh, I know this group is familiar with that, that make that move. Uh, but biggest among them, I would say, is uh, a switch to country by country regime. Um, with respect to um, our, uh, with respect to guilty, um, and also um, with respect to our other foreign tax credit baskets, um, a move um, to uh, reduce uh, QBI, uh, and a move to allow for a uh, carry forward, albeit of a limited duration, of uh, foreign uh, tax credits and the carry forward of losses. Um, you know, we think that um, from the ways and means perspective, that brings us in line with, with more with pillar two, kind of makes the guilty regime more of an um, economic minimum tax. Uh, and, and so represents, you know, a, a good step uh, in that direction. Moving forward, I think we are waiting. Um, I think things on, on the legislative front sit very much at the leadership levels. Um, as you know, I think many of you have heard, there is an effort to pre-conference as much as possible in terms of um, what we can what we can agree on between the House and the Senate uh, with the reconciliation uh, bill that is moving through the Congress. Uh, those conversations are uh, ongoing um, and a bit above my pay grade, uh, but I think there's still uh, very much uh, a lot of momentum, uh, at least in our caucus, behind making sure that the changes that uh, we marked up and reported out uh, are uh, eventually make it into law. Um, just a few notes on that. Uh, we have a very wide range of folks in our caucus. So we have some folks who would like to see, you know, the, would like to see uh, perhaps a more, uh, perhaps a proposal that's more along the lines of the Green Book. We have folks who are concerned about moving much past where the OECD is right now. And in fact, moving farther, uh, uh, then moving faster, I should say, um, than, than the OECD implementation plan. Chairman Neal's taking all that and did take all of that into account with the Mark Bell and is still taking that into account. Um, we had a, a letter from three members, I think, at the end of last week in terms of um, pointing towards a delay. We had a letter from, I think, 11 members um, before that. Uh, about the OECD process. So this is feedback that matters a lot to us. I will say there is a lot of private feedback um, that we receive uh, on this as well. Um, and I suspect that before the, before the legislative process on this is wrapped, um, there will be changes both to the spending side and the revenue raising side of this bill. Um, and so, you know, we continue to take feedback and for any of the participants on this, this um, uh, webinar, I'd, I'd invite you to, to reach out to our office um, to the extent that you have any views. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I took up three minutes. I was aiming for two and a half to give Courtney her due. <laughs> well, luckily, I think you hit on several of the points that I was going to hit on in terms of, um, you know, so perhaps I'll call it a, a lack of clear consensus, perhaps, on, on how quickly things should move on pillar two, um, and specifically with respect to the reconciliation process on guilty. Um, I think just even separately from that, um, obviously last week with the announcement, we saw Ireland, uh, Hungary, and Estonia sign on to the agreement, but we're also seeing the press reports about potential you know, side agreements and, and carve outs. And I think some of the members, including my boss, have expressed concerns about more favorable terms being provided to foreign companies than US companies. Um, so I think in, in conjunction with that, there's also, um, you know, my boss has also expressed concerns about the US moving to increase the guilty rate when no other country has a global minimum tax. And, and you know, I think those concerns being expressed are similar to what we've heard from certain House Democrats in, in letters, either to Chairman Neal or to Speaker Pelosi on you know, either moving 
faster than or further than uh, the OECD agreement um, and, and what that could potentially mean for U.S. competitiveness and the competitiveness of our country or of our companies. So, you know, I think um, that's that's a concern that I, I think my boss and, and other members are going to continue to um, highlight. And, you know, just given the current reconciliation process, obviously, Beth is much better position to provide insight on, on where things stand, stand there, but we're watching the various drafts closely. Um, and given, you know, the differences between the administration's proposals, the OECD, uh, Senate finance stems, uh, the house bill, um, there, it, it seems like there is still a, a fair amount of, um, you know, work to be done in terms of getting to an agreement there. So, We'll obviously be watching that closely, but um, you know, I think again, just going back to the same point on on with respect to pillar one, um, I think there is also an open question as to whether, you know, even if there are domestic law changes to to bring guilty closer to where the current OECD agreement is, um, certainly with the interaction between the minimum tax and the interest tax payment rule. Um, certain coordination rules, it seems like, might be better um, implemented through some sort of multilateral instrument. But uh, it seems like some of those details and issues kind of remain to be seen, and we'll have to see how that plays out. Okay, great. Thank you both for that um, whirlwind tour of um, <laughs> steps yet ahead and some of the, the uh, obstacles, potentially, things at least they have to be gotten over along along the way. Really appreciate it. And I would just observe that, you know, that the uh, competitiveness of U.S. companies, I think, largely is in the hands of Congress and whether or not you uh, write rules that are similar to what's coming out of the OECD. So, Beth, thank you for the effort that the House Ways and Means Committee has taken in that direction, and we look forward to what comes uh, uh, next in that process. And <coughs> Uh, I'll say uh, uh, thank you to again for your participation in this panel and hand it over to Will for closing. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Uh, thanks very much, Pam. And thank you very much, uh, Beth and Courtney as well. That was, that was great. And uh, Akilesh and Anthony before you. Um, so I will do a very quick wrap um, wearing my uh, chair of the ETBF hat. Um, so thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much to, uh, to Tax Foundation, to Scott and to Daniel. Uh, and to uh, the many people behind the scenes uh, who made this uh, conference possible, as I say, next year in person, we hope. Um, but this has been a great virtual conference. So the state of uncertainty, well, I think we all agree that we're, in a, <laughs> we're definitely in a state of uncertainty. Um, is, the global, is the world economy ready for a new global tax system? Uh, well, there was a question raised in the panel that I helped moderate uh, as to whether, in fact, we're moving towards uh, a new uh, global uh, tax system. Uh, I suspect that we, we probably are. Um, so uh, we had three uh, great panels. Um, we talked first about Pillar 1, who will pay Amount A, uh, and Lorraine Eden's uh, Pillar 1 tax games came to very similar conclusions um, as to the amount. Uh, I would, um, uh, th there seemed to be a consensus that, that companies would pay. Um, obviously, at, at one level, that's, that's clearly true. Um, however, it is also clear, and this is why there is such difficulty in still getting to the details, agreeing the details, not details, big structural uh, uh, issues on pillar one um, as to which countries pay, because this will mean a moving of tax revenue uh, from one country to another. Sure, that in the end, you know, that comes out of the corporate pocket, but it also comes out of countries' pockets. Uh, and that's why, that has, why this has proved difficult, and in particular, why this issue around the so-called seeding or surrender jurisdiction uh, continues to, um, uh, to be unresolved. Uh, in pillar two, um, uh, two again, very good uh, discussions, uh, the effect on locations and um, uh, Cody's intro, very interesting paper on pillar two versus guilty and um, the possible generosity of pillar two versus even current guilty, far less what might happen uh, to, um, uh, to guilty. And, um, you know, I think that uh, a lot of, um, uh, uh, of important work there and great comments from uh, uh, from Lillian for Jennifer. And then in, the, in this last panel, um, uh, well, it, it seems that um, to go back to the, the question of the, uh, that was posed, is the world ready for it? Um, it seems in some respects that less developed countries may not be uh, ready for it. There seems to be a, a level of disappointment, which is something which will have to be worked out if this agreement is to be uh, as deep as it is broad. Um, and, you know, some issues concerning uh, whether the globe rate is, uh, is high enough 
um, it seems not for developing countries, uh, and a certain level of disappointment about the subject to tax rule as well. And then finally, uh, is the US Congress ready for, um, uh, for pillars one and two? Um, we'll see. Um, but clearly there was, um, uh, you know, we'll watch that going forward uh, in some respects more in, in relation to pillar two uh, over the coming months and then as pillar one plays out, but clearly um, some different views. So again, uh, thank you very much. Thank you to, to Scott and to Daniel. Thank you to all of the presenters. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, we had up to 150 uh, folks joining us, which is which is great. There's a recording will be available. Um, and uh, we will ask uh, everybody to continue the good work that they've been doing. So again, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us and um, much more to come on this.